the spinning wheel of death. Yeah. <laughs> ours, we had our normal <laughs> Friday. Well, they were, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I haven't had Actually, a lot of I've had yeah. PSA once. Yeah. Yeah. This was Let me tell you, it was rough. Most of ours, because I drove in. They were coming down at Oh, there was Star cars up to that, those two streets up to that. There were cars all the way down both those there. streets. Wow. Not to say it's bad business, but it's part of the road work. Oh, look. We've got to slip to talk to you. We could say that. Oh, error has occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hope Jamie it's Reed, uh, she's well, it looks like it's going. Yeah. 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 I wonder if she was on. Not quite? Thumbs up. Okay. I call the Parks and Rec Advisory com um, Committee meeting to order. It's 7:12. Thank you for your patience on the delay for technology. And our um, introductions. We'll start over here on my right with Mr. Meyer. Hi, Blaine Meyer. <laughs> Oops. Bill Daniels. Mike Mitchell. Sean Dashler. Joyce Gifford. Doug Neely. Lisa Nopia. Roger Palatice. The Lewis. Um, so minutes of our February meeting. I hope everybody that was there had a chance to read those over. Are there any comments about those? I move to approve the minutes. Second. It's moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain. Wasn't here. Okay. Thank you very much. Citizen comments for issues not on the agenda. We have one comment card, and this is from Chen Francesca Anton. Hello, I know mostly everybody. Hi. Um, I'm Francesca Anton. I live at 123 High Street. And I was at the NRC. Um, I'm mostly here to support this wonderful group of people who are working on the Laterette uh, Park Renovation Project. But um, at the NRC meeting uh, earlier this month, is that right, Doug? Natural Resource Committee. Yes. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, a neighbor, a Pam uh, Cromer, and I presented a, a uh, tree inventory of the McLaughlin neighborhood, and we're moving ahead on that. And I also uh, asked the NRC to um, consider starting a No Ivy Day here in Oregon City. Um, it, we probably could do volunteer work uh, all spring, summer, and fall with invasive species in Oregon City for five years and still not get it all. But um, I've done a lot of research. It's really doable. We could take it to the CIC. They really need a project, I think. And, um, and we could go neighborhood by neighborhood identifying places and organize the, if you haven't been on the Portland Parks and Recreation uh, website, there is an incredible amount of information on how to do it, what they're doing. Um, three facts about invasive species, plant species. Um, uh, one third to two thirds of all endangered species in the United States are thought to be due to invasive plant species. The estimated uh, economic cost in the United States is fastly approaching $200 billion a year from invasive plant species. And um, uh, scientists think that um, at least half or more of, uh, I mean, we lose more habitat, more natural habitat to invasive plant species than all the pollution and development in this country combined. Wow. That's pretty big stuff. That's just the little tip to get you excited about it. But um, we maybe could work with the Parks and Rec and the CIC. I'm happy to help. I don't know how many of you are aware that last summer, uh, Jesse Buss, who's on Washington Street for his birthday, organized about 25 people, and we pulled Ivy up at Waterboard Park for uh, the morning. We had a great time. If you walk up, you can see uh, you know, where it's pulled. Uh, and that, I think that was just a couple of hours worth of work. But we had such a good time. We picnicked afterwards. It's really a great way to build community and accomplish uh, a really good thing for both people and all the other critters and plants who live here. And, and if you haven't, I would really encourage you to get out and walk this town. 
you will see so much invasive species here. So if you're not sure about what an invasive species is, just get on the Portland Parks and Rec uh, Ivy League <laughs> website. Mm -hmm. You can learn all about it. But I, I really think that it's, it's something that, that the time is overdue, and if we all work together, we can um, start getting volunteers, churches, civic groups, scouts. There's all kinds of organizations in this town who I think if we just ask them would love to help. Thank so you. Thank Francesca. you for your time. Thank you. Okay. Any follow-up comments? All right. It's something to keep in mind and I think that there are some groups in the city that are working on that and even working with Solve on that. So I'm gonna Keep pushing that forward. Thanks for coming by. Actually, we have the Park Foundation has a day scheduled May 6th with Saul in Waterboard Park. Our first presentation tonight by the Oregon City Police Department, Officer Day. Yes, please. Feel free. By the way, you are recorded, and it is being shown live. Just so I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Mike Day uh, with the Oregon City Police Department. I was reached out to by my captain uh, after I got an email from, forwarded to me from Phil Lewis as there was some concerns about uh, park safety, people being in the parks uh, in the evenings for no apparent reason. And additionally, I was asked to introduce uh, the new position that I will be going into in a, in a full-time position starting in around July, and that's going to be the homeless liaison officer position, which my full-time job will be working with our homeless population here in town doing some sort of outreach, and I'll touch on that a little bit further. But uh, as far as park safety is concerned and people being in the parks for no apparent reason and after hours, uh, after hours for our parks is 10 p.m. to 5 a.m., and if people are in the parks after that time, they are in violation of park rules, uh, which is a, an offense that is punishable by up to $500 fine and up to 30 days in jail. So if people are concerned about, or citizens are concerned about folks being in the park after hours, then that's absolutely something that they shouldn't hesitate to call us about. And it's something that we are proactively enforcing as is, but we don't see it all, all the time. So if people can call us, it's not it's not too small of a thing because we don't want folks in there after hours potentially damaging parks or one of the issues that we've been having is uh, we found uh, homeless individuals sleeping inside of the restrooms uh, particularly at John Storm Park where the bathrooms lock at dusk it's on a magnet system they get in there before the doors lock and um, that's where they find themselves sleeping for the evening. We've since caught wind of that and we've been checking those after hours um, and moving people along. And additionally, we've been able to, with, with some new code, exclude folks from parks because of things of that nature. Um, aside from that, during the daytime, if there's concerns for park safety, not specifically just after hours, but we have a whole slew of park rules that, again, are punishable by that fine and or jail confinement. So it is not against the law to be in the park from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. if you're just sitting there or even if it's for no apparent reason or whatever the case is. But there are many of things that aren't allowed there. Alcoholic beverages, use of tobacco, littering, all these sorts of things are things that if you're seeing that behavior, uh, you know, people who are starting fights or things of that nature, again, that's something that we can come and take enforcement action against. So if something's making you feel uncomfortable, um, one, you can always call us. But two, if you're seeing things like drinking or smoking or littering or whatever the case is, give us a call because that's what we're here for and we will respond. Uh, as far as my new position is concerned, uh, the homeless liaison officer, this was recently created and approved, uh, and it's probably going to, like I said, I'll jump into that role around July. And my primary job, 40 hours a week, and whatever else is dictated of me will be to essentially reach out to the homeless population. Uh, I grew up in a, with a family members that did a lot of that. Uh, I love 
people. That's why I got in this job. And there's several things I'd like to see come of it. One, homelessness in Oregon City has become a large livability issue for the general public. Uh, it's very visible. So a lot of the things that are common amongst the homeless population are uh, trespassing and or small thefts for food or um, public urination and defecation and prohibited camping, all of these things that the public sees uh, and it makes them rather uncomfortable as it makes most anybody uncomfortable. And these activities certainly by no means are limited to the homeless population, but that's the most visible it seems like from them in these areas. Uh, so one, I will be trying to educate our homeless population, reaching out to them, establishing trust with them, explaining to them these are the things that are concerning the public. The fact that you're homeless isn't isn't the issue. It's an issue and it's something that we want to address, but these activities that you may be engaging in are what makes the public uncomfortable, are what uh, puts puts you in a negative light. And if we can educate them better on that and hopefully get them to steer clear of those sorts of things or know where they can do things and when they can do things. Um, and this is just for everybody in general, not just the homeless, but that education process is going to be, I think, key. And then additionally, and the part that I'm really excited about is the, the outreach portion. I had an opportunity to go down to San Diego Police Department uh, for a couple of days where I met with their homeless outreach team. They work, they have a very large homeless population and they work uh, with mental health and they also work with uh, like social service employees as a team so they ride around in a van with an officer or someone from social services someone from mental health and they can go out and and do outreach with these homeless individuals and try and connect them with the resources that they need to help them take those initial steps to climb their way out of homelessness a lot of times the reason they're homeless is not necessarily because they want to be. Sure, there's some that want to be, but it's alcohol or drug addiction or it's uh, mental health reasons, and then everything kind of compiles and they find themselves in this situation. So part of what I want to do is reach out to Clackamas County Social Services, Clackamas County Mental Health, um, determine where the alcohol and drug treatment programs are, where organizations like Father's Heart are, uh, what they're offering, help people get vital documents, birth certificates, identification cards, all of these things that are so essential for them to be able to do things like get a job and apply for an apartment and do all those sorts of things. So I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be really positive for the city. Uh, I look forward to seeing that impact on the visible livability concerns and additionally on having an opportunity to one by one help climb people out of homelessness. Okay, thank you. Yes, Doug. I was very pleased to see that your position was created and uh, I'm pleased that you're very anxious to fill that position. Um, uh, one thing I was rather impressed, I think it was the first commission meeting of this month where a group of homeless people came up and spoke and they were they had formed a cleanup crew of their own. And uh, I think that's great. I think it would be great to encourage more of them to do so. And uh, one, one thing I do have concern about as, uh, from the homeless aspect is that um, we all need restrooms and the opportunities for them are, I'm sure, to do it in a in an appropriate way are somewhat restricted. I don't know how you handle that problem, but uh, I remember going down uh, just, uh, at John, John Storm Park, the door was locked. I got there a little early. Somebody had defecated right in front of the door. Now he probably was trying to actually go into the restroom. And I understand why you can't keep them open, but I wish there was some way that, you know, we could deal with that particular problem too. Sure, and it's something that's actually come up. Um, it's something we have to look at, it. and and potentially I don't know what what the answer is right offhand. Maybe there's a designated bathroom in the downtown area that is open 24 hours a day. I've seen things called arta potties, which are basically affixed porta potties that are decorated in a manner that they are not necessarily so. Um, stand out as a porta potty, right? And and those are something that are accessible around the clock. So I think there's certainly solutions and I know that building an additional bathroom is rather expensive and the money's not necessarily there, but there's options like this 
art of potty idea and or deciding yes we are going to leave this one downtown open and we're going to leave this one up open and there's going to be checks conducted by somebody or or whatever that case is we we certainly need to do something because you're absolutely right uh one of the biggest things is for the public is seeing someone urinate or defecate in a public place well maybe the reason is is that they didn't have somewhere to go yeah. And sometimes it's not, yeah. um, but but certainly that lack of access to a restroom is a concern, and it's something that we need to be looking at. In uh, in uh, January of this year, uh, we opened the bistro at the Amtrak train station, and uh, uh, prior to that, we met with uh, Chris Wadsworth and um, Terry from uh, Father's Heart. Brian Shaw came down. There were there were a couple of other folks there, and and also uh, Cisco Foods, so which is our the company that uh, provides us with service, and he was interested in, in in the homeless issue as well. So we had a you know two three hour conversation about that, and we've gotten to know most of the <laughs> there are several uh, homeless folks that kind of are along that road behind the train along the rail there. Uh, which doesn't make ODOT or um, or uh, uh, UP very happy, but um, um, you know they've been they've been harmless for the most part. Um, they've kind of looked over looked out for the beast drone. They, they, at least they've said they've run off a few people. Uh, so, uh, but we've we've learned all their names. And anyway, the upshot of the meeting that we had was um, the need for them to sleep somewhere. Uh, as opposed to underneath the train station. Um, and so we talked about the idea of maybe um, some kind of a tent city that could be, you know, um, anyway, didn't know if you uh, if you are planning to explore that uh, idea somewhere safe where they can be and gather at night or whatever. But maybe. So two things. Uh, one, you said that you've gotten to know a lot of them and they, they've been essentially harmless. And I will say, by and large, they... They are. They're good people. I, I know them, many of them, a large percentage of them by name. They know me by name. I appreciate and respect them. I listen to their stories. That's one thing as to why I wanted to get into this position is because I I, I, can't, I like to get down and see eye to eye with these folks because they're human beings and they deserve to be treated as such. And the perception of the homeless is that they're dangerous just on site. Oh my gosh, that's scary. Well, it's the unknown. Sometimes the unknown is scary and or people think it's dangerous, which isn't necessarily the case. There's plenty of people walking down the street that look like your average Joes that are more dangerous than, than the homeless person that you see walking and carrying all their bags down the hallway. Um, so sometimes it just takes people stepping a little bit outside their comfort zone to recognize that these people are good people. We just had a call down there the other night at the bistro where it, as a member of the homeless population called in concerned that someone was breaking into the landscape place next door. So they do call. Yeah. Um, they're not pulling your leg. Right, right. Uh, they're looking out. <laughs> uh, so, you know, obviously that person was trying to keep his community safe because it is his community also. Uh, secondly, as far as a tent city or, or whatever the case is, it, we, we are, and some of that's above above me, what's, what's allowed, what's not allowed, what the housing options are. But I'm currently on a, I've been attending several different meetings looking at affordable housing options. I recently attended the town hall meeting with State Representative Mark Meek where affordable housing was discussed. Uh, and there I made a, a connection with someone who's gonna put me in connection with their homeless uh, outreach kind of director. And so, I'm going to be looking at things where I can take individuals and hopefully get them moved into placement. I know that there's some discussion about uh, potentially making a transitional type living place here in Oregon City. And I don't want to go too far into that because I don't know what stage it sits at, but it's things that are being talked about. We know that um, we can't arrest our way out of homelessness, and so we need to be doing something else. And it's Police certainly have a role in it, and we can we can help to affect change. But as a city, as a community, as a state, we need to be looking at um, options for sure. And I can add to that the uh, planning department uh, through community development. They've just received 
recently a hundred thousand dollar grant to evaluate um, uh, affordable housing options in the community which would include uh, for the homeless community as well so uh, looking at uh, their their plans and guidelines for how folks use uh, properties in and around the region I, I want to expand on something that Blaine said uh, as far as people protecting like your situation down there and I and I know that I've been talking to Paul Edgar a little bit about this because he's interested in the homeless vets in the area sure. and housing and I, you know, I thought about you know the, the, what about taking I, I, it's not working out. hello, hello? Yeah. Um, what about taking a um, a vet or one of the homeless people and put in one in each park a sizable park for the day and he would be able to relate to homeless people coming in there I'm just I'm just showing throwing this idea out okay. mm -hmm. and uh, and there would be a small stipend or maybe we can get a grant to you know or work if something like that to help pay you know for his day there uh, we need a porta potty and he would uh, maybe you know Take care of the park. Uh, what do we have park hosts. Excuse me. We I'm do talking have park about hosts. yeah. Right. We have park hosts <laughs> and the larger ones, but a lot of parks with no park hosts. So I'm talking about you know, like a little one of those little guard houses they have over by the palace in England, <laughs> 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 where they sit in there and they can give information out. They, and it could be through the police, you know, the police, uh, uh, the department where they would vet the people and or and. Um, and so that um, we, you know, we make sure that we're getting a person there that would uh, be able to do that kind of a job, um, and would give them something to do and give them standing in the community. And uh, as as I said, they would be able to relate to another homeless person coming, and be able to maybe uh, uh, keep you in contact of what's going on. This is just an idea to be thrown. Oh, out I there. appreciate that. It's absolutely something to to keep in mind too, because if if they essentially police your own is mm -hmm. the idea right and if i think that a lot of folks who don't have standing in the community they they want that because it makes them feel a part of it and so i'm i'm willing to look at anything and everything uh and some of that's that the the decision will be something that's above my head but it's some, something that i could look at and present and it would be a process in which like you said there would probably have to be some vetting going on well if if someone's going to get paid Where's that money going to come from? Number one, but then two, how uh, how do we determine that that person is someone that's going to be effective and appropriate for that position? Sure. Officer Day, I just want to tell you thank you for your service. First of all, um, what you and the rest of this police force do uh, allows my family and me to sleep at night, and and I'm grateful. Um, I used to live right next to a park and call you guys quite a bit for the after hours calls and you guys came right away and always amazed me how quick uh, it made me think you know there must be other important things that are going on and I just pulled them away so sometimes we wouldn't call but uh, you being here tonight was part of my concern or partly my idea I drive by parks early in the morning on the way to work and see just things that don't seem normal uh, very nice fancy cars sitting there every day and you see another car pull up next to it and then they leave and <laughs> things like that and I can only assume what goes on but I guess my, my big question to you is what are some of the challenges that you see now relating to the park system that are possibly increasing uh, for example I'm starting to see a lot more graffiti lately than I have uh, I don't know much about drug use <laughs> thank goodness right but is that something that's on the rise around here? Is that possibly why we're seeing more cars sitting in parking lots? And you know, and, and all those things affect the the, per, the person walking their dog. Maybe I don't want to walk my dog through there. You know, what do you guys see? So as far as drugs are concerned, um, in addition to you know having this sort of passion for helping the homeless people, from an investigative standpoint, drug investigations is something that always kind of intrigued me, and we absolutely much like any community have a drug problem and things where you're you know as I'm just kind of listening and you say hey really nice car parked or another car pulls up for a short time and leaves the first thing that pops into my mind is hey was that potentially a drug deal that you just witnessed and so if you're seeing behavior like that repeatedly involving the same sort of vehicle or same location and 
like I said, we don't always know about it. Um, so something like that, to me, my wheels get turning. Maybe there's something more to the story, just like you, just as you're passing by or thinking something yeah. doesn't look right. And, you know, people, as just as intuitively, we are uh, pretty good at knowing when something's off. Um, and we don't, we don't laugh at a call when it comes in because, well, it's just a car in a park. You're seeing more than that. And just what you said to me, I see more than that. So I think something's going on. So one, we always, the, I can't express enough. If something doesn't look right, something's suspicious, it probably is suspicious, and we want to know about it. Um, so don't hesitate to call us. If it's not a 911 call, we have a non-emergency number, 655-8211, and we'll get to it when the emergencies aren't occurring. Um, and secondly, as far as graffiti is concerned, I certainly see it. Um, I don't know that I've seen a noticeable increase, uh, but... That being said, a lot of those calls come in as cold calls after the fact, and therefore they go through uh, a desk officer sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we while we communicate, I'm not necessarily the one that's hearing it firsthand over the phone, and so I don't always hear about every graffiti case that we get unless there's some sort of suspect or a lead. But uh, there are ways to track and um, link different graffiti people together, and I know in the past that cases have been put together where we had kind of a chronic graffiti artist and one of our officers did a good job kind of linking that. Um, so it's stuff that we look into, especially when it starts to be a recurring thing of that's the same tag at this park, at that park, at that park, at that park, taking pictures. And then collectively, once we can determine who that is, there's ways of, you know, charging each mm -hmm. incident. So if you see it and it's new, we may not know about it. So sometimes people assume. Um, it would be nice if someone responsible for the park, a, a park representative, you know, someone from the parks department who uh, is, could be listed as a reporting person who knows, is checking the parks every day. If they're the ones that call that into us, that's helpful for us uh, just because they're employed by the city and responsible for the park as opposed to sometimes we'll get someone who just passed by and called it in and we don't know if it's already been reported and sometimes it can be kind of hard to, to track that down. And this may be a bad comment, but uh, I don't support graffiti. But if you ever want to see some fairly well done <laughs> graffiti on the two tunnels that go under uh, I two hundred five, um, yeah, in back of the amazing, yeah. they're off uh, Ag kind of by Agnes. Yeah, yes. th well, there's two those thirty foot high, yeah. about twenty yep. foot wide tunnels. <laughs> and someone spent a lot of time in there doing some pretty cool stuff. So. Shame on I got to go back there. Yeah. Uh, you know, the drug issue is, uh, is becoming worse. A couple of people that have <coughs> businesses that depend upon truck drivers are having a hard time hiring young people that aren't testing positive for pot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's uh, generally a growing problem. And and when I when I was speaking of drug use, I was speaking even more so of the still Meh. illegal drugs. So <laughs> marijuana is yeah. I mean, it's everywhere. Yep. It is everywhere, no, no doubt about it. But we additionally, we have a problem with methamphetamine and heroin. and It's something that we very much take very seriously and are hard about investigating and whatnot. But, yeah, it's, marijuana is everywhere. The problem with employers is that it stays in your system, so you can, you can have a, a, you know, a joint uh, on Friday, come into work on Monday, and, and still have it in your system. And, yeah, two you weeks know. later, you still have to Yeah, so it. it's really hard. Are they coming up with any kind of a test to see if someone's actually high you know, driving? Uh, one of the difficult things as far as marijuana is we are having to articulate a, a lot through statements from the, from the individuals, you know, what – because a lot of marijuana users – they, they know their marijuana, and they know the strength of their marijuana, and they know the different types of THC and whatnot. And so if you can get them talking about, well, this was a really strong strain, and I used it within the last 10 hours, because if we're getting a urine sample and it's, test, it's showing positive for, like, a DUI driver, um, like you said, it could be in your system for several days. So we need to be able to articulate, well, yeah, it's, it's in his system. But in addition to that, he's telling me that he just used, he used this much, he was... High as a kite, he, you know, so really trying to add to the fact that his urine is going to show marijuana, but additionally, he was clearly impaired based on what I saw and based on what he told me. Joyce, just real quickly, I, I want to say I, I think Roger's on to something. Um, 
-hmm. Obviously, there, you know, there'd be a million details, and maybe it's not a daytime thing. Maybe it's a nighttime thing, and it helps us solve that nighttime restroom facility. Um, because I think, as you mentioned, or someone a couple of times, you know, the self-policing aspect, there are leaders in the homeless community, and if we work with them and said, here's what we'd like to do, we're going to open this park restroom 24-7, and you're going to have somebody there from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. And it's going to be a 30-day test. And if it blows up, it's done. But if you can manage it, you know, I, I, think, it's, it's, I think it's an idea that's worth considering. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, we, we, we have to live with the negative impacts in our parks. And I would, I would rather see us make a positive step. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, good idea. Right. Good idea, Glenn. <laughs> I like the idea, and I like, uh, we have park hosts during the day. We have the public there during the day. The public, if they see something not right, they'll, they'll probably call us. But mm -hmm. at nighttime, when people aren't supposed to be there, um, I like the idea of having somebody there who could call us if there's an issue or who, when we're on patrol, we could check in with and say, hey, any problems? You know, mm -hmm. so like I said, I'm open to, I'm open to things. It's something that I'm going to jot down and uh, be thinking about. And so... Cool. I think it's a great idea too. But one thing about the implementation, you surely want to tell the neighbors immediately to the park Absolutely. what's happening there, so they they understand Absolutely. what the possible increase is. <laughs> well, yeah. I, you know, I think it could be neighbors would get to know the person, and you know, mm -hmm. bring them cookies or whatever. <laughs> I think he's referring to the right. not the increase of one person Just being there, but the increase of now suddenly. Lots of people are coming to use the restroom at night, potentially. Yeah. I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah, um, yeah so, and, and so then location would probably also be important yeah. because, that's you know, true. maybe John Storm Park, not a lot of residents around in the after hours, but if you were putting it in Rivercrest Park, which is a park surrounded by houses, it, you know, it might have a, an undesired effect. Yeah. So something to think about and, and location would probably be very important. Okay, well, thank you, Officer Day. Absolutely. Appreciate you coming Thanks by. For me. And um, we'll look forward to another report from you after you, you know, in a year, after you've yeah, had a chance to, to <laughs> figure out what this homelessness <laughs> thing is really all about. Here. But all right. I see Francesca back there. I know that her backyard is, is along a park. And oh, I, I chase off the smokers and drinkers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've got the human pool, too. Yeah. And, and living someplace where somebody was living in the newspaper dumpster behind my house for a while and you know and and you know pissing in my yard I didn't mind that but it was the other and and, yeah. and also looking in the dumpster and seeing that they were using candles for light and living mm -hmm. in a newspaper dumpster didn't seem really safe to me yeah. <laughs> so uh, okay. but you know taking a little baseball bat out every night and banging on the dumpster just for fun was kind of fun too so. <laughs> <laughs> Making it uncomfortable for them to be there, mm -hmm. and sometimes what you, that's what you got to do, you know. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you very much okay. for coming. Thank you guys, you guys have a nice night. Next on the agenda, Girl Scout Troop forty forty five zero six four. What do you call four fifty sixty four? Four five. Four five oh six four. Four five oh six four. So, were you able to get the PowerPoint? Yes. Let's see. I got it brought up oh. now. If it will. Actually but we also okay. have. Yeah. Each of you. But, um, oh, look at that. Feels like technology tonight. Good. Uh, good evening. My name is Karen Burig. I'm a resident of the McLaughlin neighborhood and a troop leader for Troop Four Five Oh Six Four. I'm Kate. I'm part of Troop 45064. Um, I also wanted to introduce, uh, and unfortunately, Amanda, who was going to help out with the presentation, had to leave because she had small kids. She had to get to bed, um, which happens. Um, but we all have our neighbors from the park uh, right, that lived, live right around, um, live right around Laterate Park, and <laughs> as well as, uh, and they participated in um, our project that we're going to talk about. Um, but I wanted to introduce them, um, uh, Cheryl and Mark Litsky, and then, um, sorry. 
<laughs> Francesca has been an active participant in what's called the core team that emerged from this project. So with that, technology. Let's see if it works. Oh, oh yeah. looks like it's coming up. It's on our screen. Thing that I can. Yay. Yes. Oh yes, young people in technology <laughs> using the clicker. So I think this is the one. Okay. Okay. So this started. Oh, maybe I can do the. Okay. Something there we happened. go. Okay. Okay. So this started out as this part here with large puddles and nothing in it at all. This is what the park is now, and this is what we're trying to get it away from because it's still not very appealing to neighbors, and uh, it's very appealing to um, the homeless. Uh, this is just different views of the park. It's, it has steep hills that are hard to climb. It has two half basketball courts and with a wall separating them, which isn't very fun to play with, and a chain link tennis court. This picture is um, of the mural that was made by a previous Girl Scout. She uh, passed away of cancer. So the blue part, she did, she started with. And the purple part, the community finished. The fences are chain link. They aren't very welcoming to neighbors. Um, we would wanna change that if we could get funds for the park. So it's more welcoming to neighbors to walk in and it's inviting. The backboard is falling apart. Um, when it was put up, it was probably very nice, but now it's falling apart and rotting, and yeah. This, these are pictures of the two events that we've hosted. The bottom corner picture is of our first event on a rainy day, where we had 78 people turn up, which was a great turnout for our first event. The second event is our most recent event that happened in November at the Pools Community Room. We ha used our grant that we got um, to invite City Repair right, down um, to give a presentation about renovating parks. And this is a video um, that we put onto the community <laughs> news with neighbors. So, Wanting yeah, me to turn to play. Make... I'm not sure. Let's hope the so audio. Yeah, if you hover the, um... yeah, there we go. I guess the question is how we did the volume. Move. They're moving. Yeah, I'm not sure if the volume will work on. And you don't need to start it again because she was she's kind of slow at the beginning. They do and why they do it, how it helps, and um, like that's something that I've like listened to about going to our school. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't able to come on the second day, but then on the last day they were there and they were talking about they. I came and like I like didn't know what had happened on Saturday but I came and they had this whole drawing of like their ideas for the park and it was like big and it was like really good and like they were just talking about like what how they wanted to help and what they think would be best and it was, it was really impressive 
And uh, Kate, what it, what do you remember? Uh, what else do you remember um, about the event? I think on the second day, what happened was is we all got in our small little groups and we made little. Um, ideas for the park like they had cutouts of an amphitheater or nature play or outdoor kitchen mm -hmm. and so we put together like a little park uh, and we presented them to the other groups like why we think this park's good why we want this why we want the park to look this way we all took each other's ideas into account and um, I think City Repair took that back and they just made a mix of all of those drawings and put them onto a big uh, drawing uh, layout for what it looks like we want for the park. And uh, earlier that morning, we played an intersection repair game where like all the community members came together and we made just funny intersections with pop, uh, popsicle sticks and clay and all of that. Yep. to the next slide. Okay, so um, there were a lot of great outcomes from this event. Uh, there were over uh, 50 people that participated at different points in time. Um, so, but in addition to uh, being able to develop a vision for the park, it really uh, was a lot about a building community. There's another um, clip uh, about some of the Could you tell us, Mark, kind of what some of the events were that uh, you went to with uh, Cheryl? Sure. Uh, we we uh, received the notice that they were having a workshop up at the new mm -hmm. swim pool. And so we went to that the first night. I wasn't able to go to the rest of the workshop. Cheryl did. Mm -hmm. And uh, kept me informed of what she was doing. Mm -hmm. I, I was really encouraged by the uh, by what the, the city repair had to say in regards to community. And mm -hmm. uh, it, the, one of the things that struck me the, the, the most was that a uh, neighborhood that is active and a neighborhood is lit up, and a neighborhood that is involved is a safe neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it's always concerned me being that we're right next door to the park as to what kind of activity goes on there and what's it like at night. And, you know, uh, is it safe for people? And that's mostly my concern: is that is that we um, be a community and we uh, be together on on things that are in the community, get to know each other. And this is a great opportunity to better get to know people with our busy lives. And so, mm -hmm. I thought it was a great opportunity. So that, that's what got my interest. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyler, yeah, it it seems like you've. Uh, thrown your unqualified support into this project? you want to uh, throw any other reasons in? Yeah, why? I think, um, you know, it, it's really neat. I, I appreciate kind of this whole process that's happened because you have my wife, Heidi, that really at one point in time, I mean, we were taking our son as he was, you know, just a toddler, and we were taking him over to Barclay Park, like Lucy had mentioned. Um, and it, they, when they actually got rid of that park I mean they like legitimately tore it down brought in bulldozers and tore it down and so um, I think it was very symbolic like for Heidi at that point in time of like gosh we really need a park in this area um, and from that place on Lucy and her Girl Scout troop really seemed to take on this idea of you know like we have we have this whole other space that really just isn't being utilized. Um, and it is really sad, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful area. Um, it's lots of space and it just hasn't been being used And people. I mean, there's tennis courts there, but nobody uses them as tennis courts because they're run down. And, um, and then for it to grow from that place into, you know, like I think any good community change comes from, you know, one person kind of raising awareness and then other people jumping on and saying, you know, like, mm -hmm. yes, this is a cause that we could jump into and support. And then it trickled all the way through into, you know, the neighborhood. Um, and and that's kind of where the place where the, the planning meeting came to was just the Girl Scouts. I mean, they went out and knocked on every door <laughs> three times. Um, yeah. And, you know, just making sure to create that awareness and bring people to this event. Um, and, and it was really neat to see, you know, a good chunk of, of uh, the McLaughlin district kind of show up and, and participate in that. Mm -hmm. 
this has been kind of a fun little tool to bring people who couldn't show up tonight to be able to speak with you. So as I said, uh, there are over 50 people that participated. Um, there, one of the neat things that has uh, been great, there's a core team of people um, with uh, the Litzies, uh, uh, Francesca, and other neighbors that have been getting together monthly to um, take this project uh, to the next step. And we've even in December had a, a, an event where we were able to have a um, cookies and cocoa in the park. And so kind of how we can activate that space. Um, I have one more little short clip um, that we can. One of the things was the, the product of that, that uh, seminar workshop that was that one weekend. It was a full weekend, and it was a busy weekend. When uh, she had talked about it was uh, very impressive for the Girl Scouts to put all that together and to work on all those details. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things is that it's going to come out of that. That product is is going to be a design of a basic design, which will give us some ideas of what we need to do to do next. And it may be us skating together and finding out that one uh, neighbor has the ability to do carpentry work. And uh, he may have sources of people that may want to donate things. Uh, another person may be really good at, um, in our neighborhood, would be good at laying bricks or, or, or dealing with some of the even um, horticultural issues that are going to happen. So the whole idea of getting community together is to, is to uh, pool together our resources and our skills so that we can come up with a solution. And that's one of the things they talked about in the seminar. Really powerful idea. I mean, who, who would have thought? Get together and make it happen. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that happens. And I'm open to help in any way I can. So. It's like the like, old barn raising idea. The neighbors yeah. got together and built the barns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to get together and build a park. So it'll be fun. So um, this is the hand drawing that we ended up with at the end of the um, planning for the park event. It was the culmination of all the different ideas that came together at the park, and was very excited today when one more slide when we got the um, actual rendering from the city repair team. Um, so again, this is a vision, and we really do understand. Uh, we've been sitting down and talking with. Uh, Phil Lewis about really what are the next steps for this project. We understand that you know we need more information is needed before Pratt can really uh, move forward and identify some sort of or look at a master plan. So we've been trying to be creative in ways to uh, get it into a master plan uh, type of format. So um, been pretty exciting, and I don't know if Phil wants to talk a little bit about some of the communications we had about with um, potentially being able to access resources with the National Park Service in their program? Yeah, so we, we had uh, initial conversations with the National Park Service and uh, the, the Friends Group, the Girl Scouts, have been working also additionally with um, some other resources within the community, uh, working with the, the local high schools, um, DePave, and just, again, trying to pool resources in order to um, make this this dream a reality knowing the limited resources that we have uh, from a um, capital standpoint for the city uh, to put into this project um, they've been um, really working very diligently behind the scenes to make sure that uh, no stone is left unturned and uh, we have in the next couple of weeks an on-site visit with the National Park Service to uh, kind of walk the property and talk about the feasibility of um, a grant opportunity through uh, the National Park Service for some planning uh, work to happen. So pretty excited about that, if uh, that might be a possibility. And, um, you know, I, again, can't help but uh, be in awe of the energy and commitment that this group has had towards this project, which is pretty amazing. Any comments for the group, for the trip? No. First of all, I like the notion that you have uh, the uh, the nature area uh, throughout the periphery of the park, and uh, I think that's great. Um, Roger here has been talking about the fact that uh, we're losing uh, um, 
monarch butterfly habitat, and one of the things that is needed there is milkweed, and I don't know if that's built into a meadow or not, if that's possible, but it requires sun. And I think, I think it's, it could be a great opportunity, I think, for young people, um, kids and so forth, to go out and have a, a, a nature experience, and uh, uh, I'm great. It, uh, uh, it's something I, I hope we can uh, capitalize on. A dream I would have, which I think is uh, probably impossible because it would be too costly, but, and you know that it used to be a spring-fed uh, swimming pool, and if, I notice you've got a swale there and so forth, but if there was the ability to build in a kind of a natural waterway through there in the summer as well as during the wet and rainy season, that would be swell. But those things are costly, but it may be that there are some focused grants that can actually deal with opportunities that might deal with such things. But I, I, I'm, I'm really impressed. I think you've, you guys have done a great job. Well, he answered my question. I, I saw the stream feature, and I, I didn't know there was a stream in there, but I, evidently there is. So it's, that's that's really cool. I didn't. I, it's got some good elevations. I didn't see any bike jumps in there. Or, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful idea. It's great. Well, and I do think some of the, the next steps really are related to feasibility and understanding costs and, uh, and refining this to something that uh, – that potentially can come to fruition. But the idea um, for this workshop was to be able to create that vision, uh, to create the idea that we can try to aspire towards. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty ex excited, and I think the, the community enhancement grant was really a successful investment uh, to be able to go from, well, we don't know what we want out there to, uh, here's, here's something that 50 different people came up with mm -hmm. or helped participate in coming up with, so perhaps we can move, move that direction. And the homeless will love that outdoor kitchen. <laughs> they probably do in all the different parts. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll hear from us again, or at least through Phil, for letters of support for our next steps and, um, and all of those different things. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now on to general business, which will mostly be the, be the Phil show for a little while. Phil so. <laughs> show. Hey, Karen. Karen. Okay. Oh, it's 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 out of here. Pushing it that way. There we go. You have to hold it, Phil. Keep holding it. <coughs> or you can look at my screen. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to go back the other way and then do it again. Oh, there you go. There you go. Hold it. There we yeah. go. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank so you, Joyce. Let's, let's make these um, quick but in depth. Yes. <laughs> the, these are all. These are all actually should be fairly quick. So, uh, the first item is the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. Um, as you are all aware, we do have a site tour uh, for PRAC scheduled for April 14th at 2 p.m. So we'll be out on site um, getting a lay of the land. And uh, Christina will be our tour guide who's been very instrumental throughout the process and a lot of uh, great uh, information on. Um, I mean, she can go into serious detail if you guys have questions. So. Um, the other piece of that is um, I had the opportunity to, um, to see some draft documents, uh, 75 percentile uh, documents uh, for the concept uh, recently, and they're starting to really vet out and, and come to um, terms on which pieces will be included, and there's still some outstanding items, but um, as they draw closer to the, um, again, June 3rd, uh, presentation of the preferred conceptual plan uh, so hopefully you have that marked on your date on your calendars uh, as well as those at home uh, June 3rd at OMSI and it will be in that afternoon we'll have information out as soon as it is uh, completely formalized but um, if you are not already on the um, e-newsletter lists uh, definitely go to the website and subscribe because that information goes out as soon as it becomes active 
Additionally, for PRAC members, I'll make sure that you have that information as soon as it's out there as well. Any questions for Phil? Any further things needed on that? Yes, Phil. I had one other question, or at least um, an announcement for the uh, the public, anyway. As, as other tours are available, uh, starting, and do we have an idea when? Is it all dependent, weather dependent? Are they always on Fridays, and how do people uh, who are interested in the project um, attend one of these uh, tours that are given? Yeah, they're typically on, on Fridays. Uh, they can do them on Mondays as well, I guess, uh, as we went through the process. Um, they, they tend to try to set up for, for groups first, um, but you can contact uh, community development uh, to request um, site visits and um, definitely also work with any of the, the local groups, so neighborhood associations, um, or if you have other uh, organizations that you work through that you would like to put a, a group together. They are uh, kind of, it is a time commitment for those that are giving the tours. So they like to have a good group uh, before they go out there, but uh, they're open to giving tours to, to individuals as they have time available. Yeah, nice question. Um, it would probably involve more than five people or so, but uh, would, could members of the, great, of the Greater Oregon City Watershed Council be invited on this tour as well, or is that too big? Um, how many individuals do you? I said probably no more than five or six. Five or six, um, quite possibly. Okay. Uh, we're um, pretty much capped out f for the tour guide to individuals, so they would have to probably bring in another tour guide for that, but I can follow up if, um, if you'd like it. We have a little bit of time before then, so okay. we can get back to you shortly. Thank you. Yep. And, and these tours last, is that, I don't know, some of you have been on those. They're about uh, two hours, I see. Very good. And you're fed by a fire hose. <laughs> there's so <laughs> much information. <laughs> yeah, there is. And there's no bathroom <coughs> facilities on the tour. You haven't been? A long time ago. Probably a year They're ago. They're amazing. We should go more in depth. You get up to the second, third story up in some of those buildings. It'd be great to. <laughs> <laughs> might, might be a little scary. Uh, yeah. Definitely uh, have not been a lot of investment <laughs> recently in the infrastructure there. Carabiners, hard hats, <laughs> Okay. Waterfront master plan. Um, that is, uh, at this point, mostly a placeholder. Uh, we will be uh, beginning the. Uh, process of putting together the bid information for um, hiring a consultant to assist us through that. Uh, it is uh, funded, should hopefully be funded. Um, we have not gone through the budgetary process yet, which uh, kicks off um, May 1st. So hopefully we'll be approved funding uh, through the budget process, through the budget committee, and then uh, work will be happening starting in the next biennium, which is July 1st. The Ermatinger House. Uh, this uh, also is a standing item uh, at, at request of PRAC members. Uh, the Ermatinger House, uh, we are under contract uh, with a uh, local firm to do drywall and paint services uh, for the Ermatinger. And then uh, we'll be um, kind of as a side process initiating the programmatical um, elements of the Ermatinger House. So we're hopeful that. Um, will be uh, able to um, do an official grand opening at some point sooner than later. And uh, with that, the City Commission additionally has asked for a presentation at the upcoming City Commission work session, which would be uh, April 11th. So we'll be presenting during that work session. Just to let you know that <clears throat> there was the heritage meeting um, today regarding um, all the heritage sites in Oregon City with the Rose Festival and so we are going to be officially part of the Rose Festival brochure of Oregon City Heritage Days on June I think it's 23rd and 24th if that's a Friday and Saturday and um, so there is a lot of hope that we can be open on the 23rd maybe even have a big ribbon cutting. Um, coin toss brewing has even mentioned about possibly wanting to participate <laughs> in the coin toss house opening. And um, then on the 24th, ha being a 
being open for tours, if at all possible. So if we can set that as a target date, um, it would make a lot of people in this town happy. I will uh, work with my team to do, do our best. Buena Vista House. Um, so not a lot of information to share, but I, I know that we had a conversation at the last meeting in regards to this facility. Um, staff, uh, after the meeting, um, initiated the process of trying to um, connect utilities, see what that cost might be. Um, PGE was unwilling to give us a cost estimate without going through uh, the efforts of putting together a formal permit request and doing any of the work needed in order to uh, bring service back to that location. Um, so we are in the process of working with a private contractor to uh, come up with a general cost estimate for what that might be uh, to bring electrical services back to the Buena Vista house. Uh, so as of right now, um, I don't have that information to share, but we're expecting back information from them at any point uh, in the next couple of days. So. so we will get that in an email. Correct. Okay. Sean. Not me. I know, but this is for you. <laughs> Carnegie <laughs> Library Park and the signage. So the... Um, for those of you in the audience and uh, for PRAC members that might not be aware of um, conversations that have happened, um, Library Park or Carnegie Park or Carnegie Library Park, as uh, different people know it in the community, uh, where our lovely new library facility is located, uh, went through a um, formal naming process in the mid-2000s. Um, I apologize again, I, my printer was not working, and so I meant to print out copies for all of you. Uh, but the resolution occurred, um, let's see, and was voted in on uh, January of 2016 um, to change officially Library Park to Carnegie Library Park. What's the date again? Oh, it wasn't 16, was it? Uh, I'm sorry, did I say 16? I apologize. Um, it was 2006, so yeah. January 2006. <laughs> My apologies if I said 16. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that is a little bit of a difference. All right. So the, um, the language, and I might read it just so that everyone is on the same page. Um, and again, I apologize for not having printouts. Um, but it says, uh, whereas the City of Oregon City Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee um, desires to rename Library Park to more reflect of, I'm sorry, small print, to be more reflective of Andrew Carnegie's contribution to the building on the site, which no longer serves as the city of Oregon City Library and is now known as the Carnegie Center. And whereas the city of Oregon City has an official policy for renaming, uh, changing names of parks, recreation, cemetery facilities, which prescribes the process by which the city shall consider renaming a park. And whereas, in following this policy, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee designated the ad hoc naming committee to consider this issue. And whereas the Park Naming Committee and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee considered various proposed names changing to recognize Andrew Carnegie's contribution to the site. And whereas at its meeting on November 28, 2005, meeting the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee approved the motion by unanimous vote to recommend to the City Commission to rename Library Park to Carnegie Library Park as consistent with the park's renaming policy. So the, um, again, uh, changed the name from Library Park to Carnegie Library Park. Uh, the issue comes about because the current signage at Carnegie Library Park just says Library Park. Um, now speaking with representatives from the library, um, the official name of the library is Oregon City Public Library. Mm -hmm. And their wish uh, from the library is that um, it is recognized as Oregon City Public Library and not as Carnegie Library. Um, there were some concerns that the um, Carnegie Library Park 
being listed on the signage, which is also the signage for the library, might be confusing for users. Um, and again, if we were going to, my thought process was if we were going to the efforts of uh, redoing the signage to reflect the name of the park um, accurately as it was voted in the mid 2000s, that uh, there probably should be a conversation again with PRAC to determine if it uh, would be appropriate to go through a renaming process knowing that uh, the park is currently, um, uh, the intent in at least the resolution was that because the park was no longer being used for um, the library but being used for the Carnegie Center, uh, that now we have a permanent home for the library, that it made sense before spending the funds to remake the sign, which came back around $3,000, um, that it might be a conversation for uh, this group to determine if um, we might look at renaming the site again, if we would like to keep the site with its current designated name and spend the funds to um, redo the signage um, and again taking into consideration the wishes of uh, the primary use of that location which is the library and their um, their wish to again not have Carnegie Library as part of their recognition of the building itself on that location so um, I know I heard from some individuals kind of behind the scenes and I want to make sure that this was a, a group conversation and um, that I had some direction uh, from from this group okay Doug at the time that the renaming occurred uh, the Carnegie was under Parks and Recreation mm -hmm. and, the, and the and the vision was that the library was going to be at some point some very different place and I think that might have been a driver for changing the name keeping the Carnegie piece in there, uh, I, I think it should be called Oregon City Library. And the point is the, the sign is there on the Carnegie itself saying when and who and all that good stuff. Um, uh, $3,000 is a lot for a sign. <laughs> and uh, to me that sign that's currently there doesn't look that bad. Uh, and uh, you know, Parks and Rec has a limited budget. And <laughs> So you're you're going to be pending. I'm pitching pennies. I mean, we've got the park near which I live. We like to see something happen there, and uh, and uh, uh, we don't have the funds for it. And uh, you're working on the Ermitanger, and uh, you're continuing to spend spend money on it. And uh, uh, I I'd almost like maybe not to consider it at this point in the game. Uh, it's it's got a sign. And uh, it's the sign that was represented the original name of the park, which is Library Park. Um, the, um, just a little bit of the history, John McLaughlin donated that property to the city. He visualized a plaza being there. Uh, but then, of course, it became a library, and that's fine. But um, I don't know. Uh, $3,000 for a sign, uh, a lot of money, I think, personally. Sean. So uh, on another committee that I serve on, we have uh, some rules at the beginning of the meeting that they always go over, and, and one of it relates to how much you're going to support an issue. And they call it fist to five. You may have heard that before. Fist meaning I'm going to block this thing with everything possible, and a three is, you know, I'm really not sure, but I'm not going to stop it, and five is I'm going to be a champion of this. And um, I think... I was on that ad hoc committee. Uh, Doug, it was Doug's uh, suggestion originally. I think the three thousand dollars is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, I think the name needs to be correct. Um, now, that's not to say the wording on the sign couldn't be something such as Oregon City Public Library at the Carnegie Library Park. Um, but at that point, and still, we the name Carnegie needs to be there. We've, it, without that, look at what happens with society 10, 15, 20 years. My girls could be 20, 25 years old. They're going to have no clue that Andrew Carnegie gave any contribution to that site if we don't keep that name right in the front of everything. And, and 
I believed what you said back in 2005, and I was really moved by that, and I think it's important. And uh, I, I'm frankly very offended that the library um, group has taken it upon themselves to essentially rename the library and the park without ever including us in the discussion when Yes, the building is a public library, but the rest of the entire property is a park, and it's not their decision. Bill. Well, as uh, Doug knows, he was involved with the restoration of the Carnegie Library, uh, and of course then the library moved up to the shopping center, and uh, the restoration began. Uh, that's a historic site, as we know that. It's on the National Register. Uh, I'm adamantly opposed to the sign that's currently there, and again, cost is irrelevant. It was a mistake to have been put there without the uh, input of the community, not just the library board. Um, the colors are wrong. As you might recall, Doug, that the uh, Neighborhood Association actually at that time they, um, did, did fundraising, found the artist to uh, make both of those signs, both the library park sign on 6th and John Adams, and Carnegie Center sign on the 7th John Adams with the ability to change uh, the different kinds of uh, events that would take place at the Carnegie Center, uh, knowing that someday it may become a library again. But we were shocked as a neighborhood association to find the library park sign removed. There was a lot of money donated by private citizens for that sign to have been put in in the first place. Uh, we've already discussed this with Phil. He came into this new, but somewhere along the line, the Neighborhood Association was not included uh, in, in that disappearing of that sign, as well as the, um, the sign that currently is on 7th and John items, which um, was, uh, as Sean says, it doesn't recognize the fact that that is the Carnegie Library historic site, and it's an addition to that library. And, if, and signings that would indicate that it's a li Carnegie Library with the addition would be something maybe more relevant to what we're trying to do here. Does anybody know um, what the library staff, uh, is it the word Oregon City that, they're, that they want included or is it the word public or both? I believe it's they want the omission of the name Carnegie. That's my take. That's I, I don't. I don't want to speak on behalf of the library, but but I will say that they are um, they are fine with the current signage, um, and I I know that they want to recognize um, the the facility as a whole, um, and I, I you know again not speaking for the library staff or the library board or the friends of the library, um, but. Um, it's my general understanding that um, they, again, the, the blending of the facilities to create the new facility, which is the Oregon City Public Library, and, and which is the name officially of the library, uh, which, which sits within the Carnegie Library Park. I'd be interested to know more about their thinking of mm -hmm. what, you know, words are important and mm -hmm. public uh, may mean something to them and they're within their circles uh, in the library um, industry that you know I don't I'm not aware of so I, I'd like to know more about what they why they are choosing that uh, maybe as far as you know just someone kind of stumbling into it mm -hmm. uh, what about or you know something like Oregon City Carnegie Library but you know there, there seems to be one group wanting to <clears throat> you know forget history and others uh, uh, you know so I just think some kind of a compromise could be reached but Mike I think the library portion of the sign can read whatever the library board thinks it should yep. and I think the park portion of the sign should say Carnegie Library Park mm -hmm. that's its name yeah. or just Carnegie Park Carnegie Library Park is no it's, it's what it's, yeah, the name of the park is Carnegie, Carnegie Library, Library Park. Carnegie Library Park is the name of, and that's of, what should be of on the, the park as, yeah. as designated in uh, 2006. But it is true because, Bill, um, we were part of that group that donated to those um, former signs. And, and when the signs were taken down, I remember at the time, it was said, well, when all the construction is done, you know, we're going to put the signs back up. And we had no communication that they were changing the signs, what they were changing them to, they did not bring it to the Neighborhood Association, and they did not bring it to Prague. Just got an email from Maureen about the sign, so that's why okay. I raised my hand. 
Okay. <laughs> um, Citizen comment on? Yeah, yeah. okay, Denise, please step up. A little bit. Anyway, Denise McGriff, Oregon City. So we, um, we had a meeting with uh, Maureen, and basically the signage for the library was conceived by uh, Mayor Reed, who were consultants to Scott Edwards. Uh, as you said, unfortunately, there wasn't any input, but Maureen is committed to working with the community and your committee and the McLaughlin neighborhood to make it right. Uh, what Bill basically, I won't repeat what he said, but what she said she was going to do was she was going to pull some of her colleagues and find out what signage says in different communities. So it's a mix. Some say library, whatever it is, the town. Some say public library. Uh, and even and I asked her specifically about the one in Newburgh because it is a Carnegie library with an addition on the back of it. And I believe on the front side where you can see the old library it says Newburgh Carnegie Library and then you get around the side it just it's just the library, but they don't have a park around it. But um, I was gonna check in the charter, matter of fact, earlier today to see what the charter said about library park, because I've never seen the name Carnegie in front of it ever. And I've lived here that's what I was not saying. as the charter, as I recall, is library. Program. That's what I understand, yeah. and that's the sign that we had made yeah. um, when you and I were still in the same neighborhood. And that's what the sign on the corner of 6th and um, John, Adams. John Adams said. It was said just library park, so that you identified that portion of it. And then over on the other side, it said Oregon City Carnegie. What we were concerned about is that I'm not aware of any private libraries, and so the name part of the public part seemed a little... <laughs> odd to me. And since Maureen did her little survey, it's a mixed bag. Some say public, some say don't. I said, I said well, are we assuming this is a private library? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so she, her opinion is, is that she's going to work with us to make it right. That was her last email to me like two days ago. And so I was planning on getting back together uh, again with her and talking about some more. And you were working on a proposal. But that's kind of where, that's what I know as of today, from two days ago. So okay, we have Library and, Park, and we have the Carnegie Library <laughs> portion, and then we have the other part. But didn't we just talk about that in 2006, there was a renaming, and it was signed by the mayor and approved by the city commission that it is Carnegie Library Park. Correct. So no matter what the charter because, says. Because basically... If it was going to say any name, it would say McLaughlin Library Park because he's the one that Dr. McLaughlin, I try to use doctor because that's his formal title. The library park part doesn't have anything to do with Mr. Carnegie other than the building that he helped fund sits in the middle of it. It's not a park that Mr. Carnegie donated or anything. To me, that is misleading. You know, if it was going to be a name... Right. It should have well, that discussion the donor's back name. Well, that discussion was in 2006. Yeah, yeah. and again... 2006, the library park sign was there. You know, we went through every, all the check marks to get it approved, you know, in the, the way that it was it was put in. So that's, uh -huh. I just wanted to give you information since I knew that. So you, you, as a McLaughlin neighborhood representative, has been working with the library director yes. Yes, on that. Yes, and directly. And can somebody from PRAC be also with you on that, or we're just going to include it's, Phil? It's just or? been very informal at this point. We've just talked about it, and we were going to get back together again, and uh, that depends on his schedule, her schedule, to talk about you know where we kind of need to go. As I think the other thing is is that the neighborhood has committed to donating some money again for the signage, and I'm assuming. For my speaking for myself personally, I know there's some of us who are willing to go around and talk to people again that we talked to before saying we're really sorry the sign got taken away unfortunately but we'd like to put up a new sign and would you be willing to you know help donate to that again so that's where we kind of are on the money situation so you know there's there's a little bit of seed money there so know, know okay. that we thank said we so want much. to do that <laughs> and I, I want to add that I was part of that meeting originally before I became a member of PRAC but um, it it, it, it hurts that it wasn't discussed mm -hmm. again because it was a pro it wasn't like the city put these signs up it was and they but they let the neighborhood and the community put 
do the whole process, which was about three months, finding the artist. There was gold leaf involved on this printing. Um, it was it was meant to stay. And the original sign, I didn't know that it had even been changed in 2006 to Carnegie Library Park because the signage never changed on the on the board by the by the pool. It still said Library Park, and as Denise said, it was McLaughlin's Park. It wasn't Carnegie's Park. So that would be a misnamed. Well, if, if you, like I said, if you go back to it, it would have been McLaughlin's Plaza because that's what he donated for, not a library. So, I mean, no. you, get, you, get, I mean you get tied to all these things, and I think what we need to do is simply come to a basic agreement of who gets recognized at the site. Mm -hmm. And I do think Carnegie should be recognized in the park, but I, I support the Oregon City Library because you had so many people voted for that expansion. And it's not a simple addition to the, to the original building because the square footage is about two or three times bigger than the original one. Well, I think it was always intended to become the library again. That was the yeah. rest. That was the rest. That was for the restoration. But uh, I think a, a number of people would like to see the name Carnegie attached to that main sign on Seventh and John Adams, whether it says Oregon City or whether it says Public Park or Public Library. Excuse me. Um, that's not as important to me as that there should be recognition that that is the Carnegie Building. It's a historic register building. Well, fortunately, um, signs can be changed mm -hmm. and redone, and um, and it doesn't need to get done tomorrow. No. So I'm glad we're going to be continuing the discussion. But I see, Roger, <laughs> did you have a well, comment? Well, I, did, I didn't hear where it, what happened to the old sign. That is, is a good question. Away, with, the, with the gold leaf that we is paid for. Is it stored for? away? Uh, the the old sign uh, was removed as part of the construction project and was uh, either recycled or um, disposed of. Wow. Okay. Yes. Um, and it, just for from a logistical standpoint, there was a. It did happen, I think, during a transition of of Scott leaving, Denise coming in and then me coming on. So there was, at least from the park's staffing perspective, um, some change and, you know, I always want to work with uh, the library at that location on, uh, you know, trying to make sure that we're tracking pieces that affect both the library as well as park users um, and moving forward as we do move forward on properties where we have joint interests, uh, we will continue to monitor and, and try to make you know all of our processes as transparent as we can um, but also at a, a certain point you know staff sometimes have to make judgment calls behind the scenes and what rises to you know doing a full public involvement process I know there was a process that happened for for the park and um, again having not been there I'm not sure which pieces <laughs> were brought forward to PRAC or to the Planning Commission or to the Library Board um, but I, I've told Denise and Bill that it's my intention as we move forward um, on you know different pieces that we try to be as transparent as possible so um, I, I believe I have received information that the uh, PRAC would be um, uh, would recognize that this isn't something that would need to be done right away but it is important and that we should probably continue to, to work with stakeholders and make sure that we come to a consensus that makes sense for everybody. I agree. I hate to see a board war. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you might be able to take Not a board war, but a board war. <laughs> board war. <laughs> yeah, Sean. Um, I'd like to make a motion that the Park and Recreation Advisory Committee on March 23rd 2017 reaffirms that the current name of the park is Carnegie Library Park. I'll second the motion. Okay, so moved by Sean, seconded by Doug. Um, any discussion? Yeah, so, I, I'd like to. I'd like more information. I'm, this is the first time I've even heard of this whole controversy. So, yeah, I guess it's been a closed email, and that should have been the case. I mean, I've been involved in it. And I, yeah, I, I, I think I'll withdraw my second because okay. you're you're right. Uh, uh, the a lot of emails between me and Sean and 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 uh, Phil, but uh, I, I think he's right. I think uh, I I I, th I I think you're right. Well, and and. So let me explain myself first. By the way, I'm not opposed to it. No, no, just, let, yeah, and, and yeah. let me explain myself. So at first I had no idea what was going on, and I saw the sign and thought this is wrong, and I remembered the history. So I included the chair, vice chair, 
and Doug, because it was his original proposal and I didn't include the rest, um, because I didn't expect it to go anywhere. I thought it was probably just a mistake. <laughs> um, and then my motion um, is is simply to reaffirm its current name. It's not to say that next month or in three months we couldn't come up with an ad hoc committee and change it. But today we are re-recognizing that it currently is as opposed to what it, it visually is not as it's represented. <laughs> In any case, I would draw my second. So. I, I, I think I think you're right. I think we need a, a greater discussion among our board. And uh, um, so, unless somebody else seconds it. Well, I would like to make a make a motion. If there is no second to Sean's motion, that we defer this uh, to a to another date, perhaps next month. We could have a better discussion if we have some more information come to some conclusions and getting some stakeholders involved on on coming up with some different ideas about renaming both of those signs that are that need to be replaced I'm not sure we need that as a motion we can just um, table it till our next meeting to what degree has the library board been involved in this dialogue my only communication monologue. has been has been with uh, Maureen, yeah, uh, okay. so I, I have not had any other discussions <coughs> with uh, anyone at the library beyond the library director. Yeah. Um, and and her information that she provided to me was that the official name of, of the library being Oregon City Public Library, mm -hmm. and uh, that yeah. they, they did not wish to have Carnegie as part of the official library title. Uh, was was the information that I received from her. And we respect that. It's just that... Mm -hmm. Carnegie is part of the park title. So. Correct. So. Yeah, and uh, and again, I I brought it forward because I thought it was important to make sure that there was a discussion, and uh, the usage of the park had changed since the original uh, resolution. Um, but knowing that the official name of the park is Carnegie Library Park before spending uh, city resources um, on redoing the signage that uh, it made sense to have a conversation uh, to make sure that the name still reflected the will of, of PRAC. And I, in fact, I, dis I had a discussion with Maureen today about a very different topic. It did come up, and, and Denise there you know, put forward was quite correct. That she, yeah, yeah she, she's very she, willing to work. She feels the name of the parks are our thing. Yeah, and she's very willing to work with us. I just yeah. want to make sure that uh, us was not just uh, me behind the scenes and that no, it was uh, a little bit more transparent. And I'm glad the McLaughlin neighborhood's also mm -hmm. on board and in, in wanting a say in that and possibly having some funds to help us. Yeah. So that was my motion is to table the uh, the item the agenda item until perhaps next uh, our next PRAC meeting. I'll second it. It's, I, I just in Robert's rules does that require a motion so uh, the agenda it, we have had a first and a second so we probably should vote okay. but I yeah. will say yeah. as as a matter of um, of setting the agenda it's typically uh, can be set by you know having any member uh, working with the chair of the committee uh, to set the, the agenda for the next month but we can go ahead and vote on it since there was an official motion there's no further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. SDC budgets. Uh, so this was an item that we uh, discussed briefly at our last meeting, uh, going over the um, current resources and um, expenses expected going into the next biennium. Um, and um, we did speak briefly about the SDCs and which uh, types of uses we can use SDCs for as far as capital investment in our park system. Uh, Bill uh, asked that we bring this forward for this month, so I will uh, defer to, to Bill to speak further on that. Um, <clears throat> SDCs. <clears throat> Um, which can be used for, as my understanding is, uh, for park SDCs, is that they can be used for um, improvements in existing parks. Uh, in, if uh, if uh, an asset 
um, is not already a. Uh, in other words, it's not a maintenance item. It's not a replacement item, but it can be. Is if I'm c correct in understanding the STC process, that it can be used uh, not only in the new parks. Quite often, it is used in just the new parks where where uh, the STC money quite often is generated near. But my understanding is it could be used in other existing parks who might be. Uh, they might have. Uh, been absent of, of assets, for example, lighting, pathway lighting, um, where um, in those particular instances that we could discuss the size of budgets and whether there would be uh, um, money to be dispersed to other parks that we, as this group, might have interest in um, improving their parks that, be, uh, that never had a chance for SDC money, for example. Uh, that's a relatively new concept and in, in, in uh, government and so I was hoping that that's something that we could have a future agenda item on to talk specifics and letting Phil uh, have a, a better understanding of um, a complete understanding should we say on how SDC parks SDC money could be spent in the community and SDC's can be used to uh, increase capacity and so SDC's um, as um, kind of a, a general use are for increasing capacity. Uh, the um, fees, again, are brought in from development. And so as we have new homes going in, uh, they pay a fee, um, a system development charge, uh, which is dedicated towards parks. Also, additionally, it can be dedicated towards uh, transportation, uh, water systems. Uh, sewer systems, things like that. Uh, the parks SDCs, um, as Bill mentioned, have historically been used for uh, either acquisition or new development uh, within our system. Um, we have not, um, in, in previous work that I'm aware of, um, used SDCs to uh, develop already existing parks in a way to increase capacity. Um, and again, I believe it's been um, Part of a you know looking at, at our uh, growth and providing opportunity for individuals in portions of the city that have not had opportunity for uh, parks let alone um, increased capacity at their parks within those communities so i assume capacity means more people using the park as opposed yeah. to you know enlarging the borders yeah so the idea like uh, as bill suggested you know putting lighting in a park uh, during the winter months would be increasing capacity uh, during the evening hours at that location. So knowing that the park closes at 10, it might get dark at 4.30, uh, between 4.30 and 10 p.m. Uh, folks would be more <laughs> likely to use the park knowing that there's lighting on the pathways or lighting at a tennis court or a soccer field um, as opposed to uh, the current conditions of, of that location. So it would be uh, most likely, um, again, uh, a percentage increase looking at those types of uh you know that was the conversation that we had previously is you know what type of capacity does that build at a location um you know during the summer months it doesn't get dark till 9 p.m uh, park closes at 10 during the winter months yes it, it would increase an opportunity to uh, for folks to use that that facility um our general stance has been um again uh, new developments or new parks would it apply at all uh, to a park, a mature park that's virtually unused, uh, Laterette. Um, the the park in its current condition is built out, and um, I don't believe that it would be uh, SDC eligible um, in its current form and going through any redevelopment of that that facility. Filbert Run Park, though, would. Yeah. Filbert Run would be uh, definitely a park that uh, SDCs could be used for. Um, and, uh, you know, often acquisition, uh, we could use it for trail development, for trail systems that are currently planned but not um, developed. Um, you know, there, there are other, there are many different avenues. Uh, we currently, again, um, SDCs are anticipated to be used for the Glen Oak uh, Park development. Uh, SDCs um, are also being used at the uh, Willamette Falls Legacy Project. Um, and moving forward into the next biennium, um, uh, those those are two projects that we will most likely be using uh, SDCs for during the 17 to 19 biennium. 
Who would I go ahead, Sean? I'm sorry. So uh, originally I had asked for this to be on a future agenda last fall, right after you're hired, I think, December, January. Uh, and, uh, and then I missed last month. So forgive me if I'm asking the question again and everybody else has already been over. Did you go over dollars last month? We did. Okay. So uh, we are anticipating, um, again, this off the top of my head, so the numbers <laughs> might not be exact. Uh, we are anticipating um, $1.2 during the next biennium as uh, revenue coming in for Parks STCs. And again, it totally depends on development. So if we see a large um, cove development um, break ground, that might be additional STCs that uh, you know far exceeds what we had anticipated. Um, the I believe this year we're uh, on pace to uh, bring in about six hundred thousand. Uh, last year we brought in, I believe, roughly eight hundred thousand. So are, you, are you in a position, or did you pass out a budget that I included, did. showed that? Yes, and I can get you a copy. Yeah, I'd like to see that. My my specific questions and the reason for bringing it up were to see the budget and see how that related to Glen Oak and Filbert Run, what what those parks were uh, estimated full build out construction costs. Uh, I think there was a conversation about uh, with Glen Oak at least if the land could be cleared in some basic construction, kind of a phase one, two versus full build out and, and kind of how that tied together with existing funding. Yeah, and I can go into the next item on the agenda is the Glen Oak Park um, update. So if uh, I can tie together, uh, yeah, I okay. can tie that together if there aren't any additional questions on SDCs in general. Bill? So uh, what I am hearing is that, when a, for instance, when Blaine had asked about Ladder Rat Park, mm -hmm. um, what I'm hearing from you is that it probably would not be eligible for SDC money. Be, and how, what is the difference between that and, shall we say, um, Atkinson Park, for example, that needs um, amenities, shall we say? So if you're replacing a current amenity with a like amenity, uh, you cannot use right. SDCs for that purpose. So if you have a trail that is deteriorating, you cannot um, use SDCs to put in something else on that developed, you know, on that trail that's already there. Um, Ladderette Park is completely built out. Um, we would, you know, we wouldn't have funds available to spend uh, SDCs on that property. Um, frankly because we we wouldn't have i mean it's uh it, it's pretty developed i mean it's it's not developed it it's well past its useful life uh but it is a developed park um i don't mean to interrupt but i keep coming back to lighting correct does light red park have lighting in that park i don't, don't believe it does no but i i don't imagine that we would put lighting in a in a park that is in the condition that ladder park is currently in but S would I assume that perhaps any money that's um, issued through SDC funding would need a master plan of that park to be able to qualify for additional yeah. SDC money if it's already been built uh, in the past? And I'm going to use lighting again as an example. So in order to utilize funds for um, SDC funds for projects, they have to be um, there has to be current uh, capital uh, capital plan for the SDCs. So the SDCs have a separate capital um, list that is used. Um, the The current list does um, does include development of uh, neighborhood parks, uh, regional parks. Um, so, uh, for example, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project being being a, a regional park. Um, the um, And again, those are those are for for new development pieces. Uh, if we were to reinvest in current facilities, it, it is my understanding. And again, we would have to work with our legal uh, team, but it's my understanding that uh, it would have to be laid out directly in the uh, the plan for SDC capital improvement projects uh, to list um, increasing capacity within existing parks. Um, that might be an agenda item that this committee would would take upon themselves if we wanted to perhaps have a a, a list that we can agree on a prioritized list of maybe several parks whether it's next year or 10 years down the road but at least have 
those priorities in mind for and when there's extra X SDC money uh, to use again I'll use lighting as a prime example of where that most of a lot of our parks I won't say most don't have lighting and sure. would certainly make <clears throat> make the usage of that park uh, probably significantly increase the amount of people using them whether it's day or night but at least giving that concept of having um, some safety involved in in the use of those parks I like where you're going with that bill however I would also th say that in in the last 10 years since we've been trying to get Glen Oak Park off the ground we can't get to we can't get to step one and step two <laughs> mm -hmm. so to look at adding light I mean Wesley Lynn hasn't even had phase two built uh, and it was constructed in 2004 so 12 10 12 mm -hmm. 13 years ago so it seems like a great idea but I just have a hard time even making the expending the effort when we can't even get our two our number one and number two priority bill at all it's, which is disheartening Doug I was just going to make a point that it was probably at least that long from the purchase of the land that the yeah. phase one got uh, uh, put forward. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's problematic. There's no question about yeah. it. Um, I would say it's not a criticism of the process because if you have land available to get a park, you better get it uh, when you can get it. Otherwise, <laughs> somebody's going to develop it. Uh, but I, I agree. There's this, we've got this n bad nexus between the building a park and getting the land for it yeah yeah the land to yeah. build out and uh and a couple of different uh things to consider so uh, again um like doug said you know it the acquisition piece is important because uh, land prices continue to go up um sometimes more quickly than uh you know the stc can catch up with um additionally um you know, once you lose uh, properties to development, it's very difficult to, to get them back for um, to use for green space. So, you know, definitely balancing acquisition versus development of the parks um, is something that you need to balance. Um, I would also say, I mean, I'm I'm a proponent of land banking and and making sure that you have properties available uh, to build parks on. Um, but there's also on the flip side. Uh, the need to develop the park so that they can actually be used, which is the intent of, you know, the land acquisition. So, um, you know, it definitely is a fine line. Um, I can appreciate the needs of all of our communities not having the types of resources that they wish that they had. Uh, Lateret Park being a prime example. I mean, we have a, we have a square block that um, in its current condition, nobody chooses to use. And uh, that that's troubling for us. Uh, I would say one of the pieces that um, the, the Commission has asked for us as a department is to look at alternate funding mechanisms for our park system. Um, we're not fully funded in the way that we probably should be uh, to serve our community in the way that the community would like. And so uh, part of the work that we'll be doing over the next biennium is looking at um, how do we find ways to, to fund our, our system in the way that uh, the community wants, to, wants it to be funded. I did have a question. Um, I assume that there is a criteria, you know, for, you know, tagging on what you said, Bill, about, um, you know, prioritizing safety, capacity, um, beautification, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, is, is that, do we have that in terms of how to prioritize maintenance projects? Um, correct, yes. We do have, uh, so the safety is always first. So if we have current facilities that are um, in, unsafe conditions uh, we do prioritize that as much as possible um, you know we have received some funds uh, for deferred maintenance that we uh, continue to use and uh, try to hit the properties that have the biggest um, bang for the buck as far as the, the improvements so um, I would just say again we're we're not funded to the way we would like to in order right. to to um, fully hit all of those pieces that that need uh, safety uh, in particular you know we have a lot of um, asphalt walkways that are that are cracked or um, 
have uh, divots in them that are that are not safe uh, but we you know try to hit those as much as possible other things that we um, try to use as a metric is uh, access and so um, you know ADA code has changed since a lot of our uh, facilities have been made and so we have restrooms that are not ADA accessible um, so it's uh, difficult for users uh, when they're out in our parks to use all of the facilities that uh, able-bodied citizens can use so that's another thing that we use when we're doing that evaluation one of the reasons I asked that is that uh, you know Mike and Roger and others have done a Joyce and you know done some wonderful work with the Oregon City Parks Foundation and that's kind of a twofold you know there's a short-term strategy with that organization but there's also a long-term strategy and you know that we hope to develop uh, you know uh, uh, planned giving uh, and, and I know of organizations I'm involved with that you know, have had bequests uh, people giving in their wills and hundreds of thousands of dollars have come in so you know it's it's down the road no doubt but uh, uh, I think that that's uh, that's a source that could be and if there's a list of things prioritized that you know be nice to but anyway and I'll um, just ask one more question because I'm new to this group and I haven't followed every month like I probably could and should have uh, I enjoy the work. I enjoy this this uh, this group here too as well. But I I was wondering, um, have we? Uh, and, and we probably have. But I'm wondering if we for a future, uh, and I can wait till future motion for agenda items. But I have we discussed much about other sources of funding, um, getting out of the box that we're in here with with general fund money and uh, other ideas. Uh, certainly the elephant in the room. I would think. So that we can get uh, more things done in a quicker, quicker time amount of time. Is that is that something we have discussed as a, as a group? Oregon City Lottery, <laughs> <laughs> for example. Sean, I'll, Sean and I will be out there with the scratches. Um, I, I, I don't have the, the historical the, context that some of you might. I was going to say I think the elephant in the room is that we we all talk about it outside of this table, but we haven't as a group had a discussion it's like we know it's coming yeah. is no, that it's, fair yeah. it's kind of the ideal of the parks foundation is to to help with that but we're a small group of volunteers who are new at this and you know we're just we're learning and trying to find those grant opportunities that that can help trying to find that volunteer base that can help um, and then once we have a little bit of that, then then looking for those major donors who might want to help us along. But I don't know if we want to be naming, um, you know, uh, I don't know who could donate. Benchmade, um, you know how some places, you know, they they get corporate sponsorships for something. Um, I don't think it's a city, you know. We want to be doing that, but that could be part of the discussion too. Um, Benchmade Library Park. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, if I could, why don't we why don't we add this to a, an agenda item for next month and yeah. and yeah. move along? I okay. think it's a good topic to have, and maybe we should just yeah. finally bite the bullet and do it. All right, I agree. Um, and yep. and when is that biennium budget? Going to happen May first. Uh, the uh, bud budget meeting is May first. Uh, the biennium budget um, again kicks in July 1 um, and the budget meeting uh, if additional meetings are, are necessary I believe are scheduled for the second and fourth but I, I would have to double check May 1st is the first meeting date so if anybody has any great ideas make sure that Phil hears them before <laughs> that budget meeting try to squeeze them in Okay, moving on to the um, Park Foundation Perfect. grant proposal. Why is that? I'm did, not sure why that's... Did we cover the Glen Oak Park grant update? Oh, we, nope, oh. because I wrote Filbert Run over the top of Glen Oak. <laughs> 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 I know some people that would like that. Um, just, just a quick update on Glen Oak uh, grant. It, it is due at the end of the month and uh, will be submitted uh, again within the next week. So... Um, 
Uh, we are hopeful that it is successful and we'll have... Pass oh. that letter on down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Joyce. Hmm. Um, and uh, we, we should find out again in early fall uh, if it is successful. Okay. Now is why is the Oregon City Foundation Park Grant proposal? I put that on there just just to make sure that it was tracked, uh, as I knew that it had a, a similar deadline as the Glen Oak Park one. So I'm not sure if uh, Roger wasn't aware of it, but if he wants to say anything about well, that. I had it in my um, member items. Oh, but okay. Whatever you want. I, I didn't know if you put it on there because uh, we had asked for. <laughs> Uh, a support or a letter of support and I didn't know if that was something to do with PRAC that's why you put it on there or uh, if there was a letter of support that was uh, being uh, requested from PRAC then I guess this would be an appropriate time to, to make that request is there one yes there is <laughs> which grant are we talking about because <laughs> we're going after several the one that's due next Friday is that the Hardy Plant yes. Society okay so what do you need from us a letter of support from PRAC. <laughs> from the chair of PRAC. Okay. From the, yeah, from the chair of PRAC. Right. Um, I, can I, I don't know that it's appropriate for me to do that because I'm kind oh, of I see. wearing both hats. I, I, I'd like to make a motion that the Park and Recreation Advisory Committee supports the Oregon City Park Foundation's grant proposal for the Hardy Plant Society. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Are hardy plants the kind of things that Paul Bunny used to cut down? <laughs> <laughs> trees? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other general business at this time? <laughs> um, People have been discussing future agenda items, and that's down there. Okay, never mind. I have another general business item. What? I have another Go ahead. other general business item. I was just oh, wondering if somebody, yeah, you're not the chair. <laughs> if somebody that went to the Newell Creek Canyon Metro thing could maybe during their uh, member report, yeah, that's on, my... on that. <laughs> okay. Because I was unable to do it. Thank you. That's all. All right. Any other general business that needs to be brought up? Okay, so we will move on to member reports, and um, let's move down there with Roger. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, uh, I, I have uh, the Pioneer Center items to report. Um, the Pioneer Center will be closed next week, March 27th to the 31st, for maintenance and cleaning. Um, that ballroom floors will be sanded and sealed, carpets and furniture cleaned, phone lines moved internally to the basement electrical room, paint touched up and throughout the building. And uh, I, so that's it for that. I have some items for the Parks Foundation, but um, let's see, uh, I, I'm not sure. We already, we, we asked for the letter of, uh, of support and I, I didn't know if everybody was aware of what we're doing here. I know that I sent something to Sean because we, we wanted to find out if, if we were going to get support from the VFW on this. But I, I'll just go over it really quickly. So that every, uh, the OC Parks Foundation will be submitting an application for a grant of $1,500 with the Hardy Plant Society of Oregon on or before March 35th. The grant will include a small and enhancement at Pioneer Center with the major portion of the grant to be used to enhance the prominent park entrance by the VFW post. Starting at the proposed Vietnam Memorial, the, the area is approximately 100 feet long with widths of varying of uh, 10 feet to 25 feet from the sidewalk to the parking lot as it goes, goes uh, north uphill. The area is currently rocks and weedy grasses with a few iris. Our intention will be to replant as much of the area as funds allow with drought-tolerant flowering perennials and small bushes. With the addition of signage, the area would be useful as an instructional showcase to show water conservation methods 
through the use of drought-tolerant plants like coneflower rubiaceae, uh, black-eyed susan, echinacea, California fuchsia, yarrow, manzanita, lavender, milkweed. We believe many types of birds, butterflies, and other pollinators will be attracted to, to the enhanced area, area year-round. It is also our plan to amend the soil and seed the small planting strip in the parking lot with several types of poppies. Um, there is a budget. We have, we have a, uh, and I, I, we did talk with Phil. We are having slight difficulties getting the grant in proper order, and, um, but it's being worked on. And um, uh, we have a budget right now of, uh, somebody plugged Mike's ears, it's uh, $10,000. <laughs> so um, that's, let's see, and that's all. And I do have uh, some other things to report, but due to the time, I think I'm going to leave those to the next meeting. Although, I just want to sneak in, I did mention the Ivy poll, May 5th, at Waterboard Park with, uh, in partnership with Solve. Fifth or sixth? Sixth. 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 Thank you. And with the McLaughlin Labor Association. Partnering with well, them too. Uh, we haven't notified them yeah. yet. So well, I we were working on that. <laughs> <laughs> we almost did when Denise was in the room. She would have found out. But I don't now want she's to, not you know. here. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could put them on the spot, but you would recognize you right now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> then it'll look bad if they say no. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa. Oh, well, I've had a very busy but fun month. Um, I made it a personal goal to go out and revisit the parks. And uh, along with my sidekick, my dog, Lucy, and um, she's had a blast. Um, really now being on the committee, looking at the parks from a different perspective rather than a visitor, but as someone who has more involvement, uh, taking it to the next level. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. Um, Atkinson Park was actually one of my favorites, and uh, we were chatting about graffiti before. It's some really good graffiti was on one of the bag buildings. It's <laughs> 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 very artistic, and, um, but uh, just really enjoying uh, seeing things from this side of the table, if I can put it that way. Um, I'll continue to do that. I've also uh, been attending our neighborhood meetings in Park Place. I um, have been in Lower Park Place. We have the, the neighborhood park. And I've been interviewing or very casually um, asking neighbors, would they be interested in some sort of neighborhood cleanup or participation? We had been discussing the uh, possibility of planting wildflowers or um, some plantings to attract bees and butterflies. And uh, people seem interested. So just at a very top level, superficial level, um, people do, there does seem to be an interest in that. I think that would be great, getting community involved. It seems like it would be a fun thing for people to do. Maybe now with the invasive species, maybe we could be also pulling some ivy. There's a lot of ivy in that park. Um, so been busy, but fun. So we had um, a neighbor from from there came one time concerned about the bathroom there at Park Place Park. Um, has any of that been remedied or if you, you noticed? I don't know what the concern was, but actually I went there about two weeks ago. Um, I actually used the facility and to me it was clean. It was clean and functional. So maybe it was remedied. Right. Since it then. was locked. Yeah, I seem to remember it was. Oh, it was they was, had it been open. locked. Oh, right. Yeah, they had been. But I went on a Saturday morning, but it was about two weeks ago, and things were fine. So did they still have a park host at, at the park? There's a vehicle park there, but I have not seen the individual for some time, and I just presumed that they were away for the winter. No, it's their job. Their job. <laughs> <Yeah. So. laughs> Feels like that's how it's supposed to go. Okay. Hang on. Doug. Yes. Um, uh, a couple of things I had mentioned sometime before. The Greater Oregon City Watershed Council is um, making a uh, has raised funds for a match to 
Public Works uh, working on a creek called Scattering Creek, which mm -hmm. flows below the mausoleum down to a lower portion of the cemetery. Uh, and uh, we'll be passing that money over to the, to, uh, uh, to the Public Works Department, which will be working on it. Uh, down in this area, there are what are called slag ponds. The, if, if you've gone down in this area, you go through a slope, and then all of a sudden it flattens out, and what it apparently was, was a slide at one time that just dropped the whole thing, uh, but it's a flat area. And these slag ponds have developed down there. <coughs> There's at least one on Metro owned pro property as well. Um, the Environmental Learning Center is going to do a major restoration this summer. Uh, it will be dewatered, uh, there will be re some rechanneling and so forth to make it a uh, b better for stormwater control but also make it a, a better habitat quality. One of the, one of the requirements is that uh, there's a salvage effort to go on, that is to catch critters that are in the current ponds and try to transfer them to someplace else. And uh, uh, the Oregon City Watershed Council have walked as, as secured, uh, it, it, the, and, and the Clackamas and Community College has secured permits to take those critters from there to someplace else. And it, it would appear that probably the best place to take these are slag ponds. They are not that affected by stormwater issues and so forth. And so uh, I've been working with Martin Montavo at the, uh, the, uh, the operations manager in, in public works who was recognized incidentally mm -hmm. at last at the city, state of the city as the c city's employer of the year uh, to actually uh, transfer those over and uh, also working with the metro re uh, regional government their, <coughs> their, their, their main person in terms of uh, wildlife issues to use their slight pond as well for those kinds of transfers and the idea would be in the fall and the next spring to transfer as many animals as we can without depopulating the slag ponds back into the ALC to get to the animal populations reestablished. And so that's an ongoing activity. Is that S-L-I-D pond? Slag. Yeah. Oh, slag. Sag. No, SAG, excuse me. SAG pond. SAG, SAG. Okay. SAG. I, Maybe I said slag, that's not good. SAG. Okay. Yeah. I have sure. nothing. Oh, you're, you're going to go last. Yeah, I'm going to go last. Okay. Um, for those who would like to join us, our foundation's next meeting is next Tuesday night, the 28th at 7 o'clock in the wagon room at no, the... No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's down. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so Pioneer Center. Go ahead. It's, it's down at uh, the train oh. at uh, Blaine's. Oh, it is? Blaine's it's Station. A, Did that depot. get worked out? It's at the Blaine Station. Okay. <laughs> it's, at first, it's at it's at First City Bistro, um, First City and Bistro. At, the and our right. Tuesday Tuesday seven o'clock at First City Bistro, and our intention is to um, give the agenda its proper notice, and then perhaps go up the street because uh, Oregon City Brewing Company this month uh, they have a a uh, program called uh, Community Pints Night every Tuesday night. Every month they choose a different charity. This month it's the Oregon City Parks Foundation. Ooh, nice. So for every pint of their beers that's purchased every Tuesday night, the foundation gets a dollar. So, and that'll be the last one of those in the month of March. So we're hoping to get our agenda done and then. Okay, who, who's going to so, be who's going to be our designated driver? <laughs> <laughs> so Coors Light wouldn't qualify then. No, that. it okay. doesn't. It has to be theirs. We discovered that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay, so yeah, that is um, that's that. I think he's got and I, I apologize oh, because no, it's so I'm late. Spoiling, spoiling. But oh, yeah. I have to say this, and I I'm really torn over it. And I want to make sure I say this right. Because I think what the Girl Scout troop is doing at Lauderette is wonderful. And it's something that I think if we could get more and more groups to do this kind of an adopt-a-park thing, I think it would be great. But, and you knew that was coming, right? Mm -hmm. This, you can't do something like this without involving staff time, without involving parks funds of one sort or another and we know those are constrained 
we have a master plan and I don't think this park and I'm not be, I don't mean to be critical of this right. particular project because I think it's wonderful but my concern is how do we deal with this is I, I, if you're going to be real crass about it this is jumping to the head of the line perhaps <clears throat> which concerns me when we have Glen Oak Park that we've talked about a lot when we have Filbert Run Park that we've talked about a lot so I, I think at a future agenda item whenever the time is is right we need to talk about or maybe we don't maybe you guys can tell me forget it quit worrying about it Mike how do we juggle um, how do we encourage community involvement like this and still make those projects fit into a coherent master plan if I don't need to worry about it so, let me know and I'll quit worrying about so it. So Mike at this three-day meeting that they had that I attended some of um, the the sustainability of it was a big discussion right and they understand when they look for the funding for this park that they're going to need to also look for being able to sustain it um, they understand it you know so that the Girl Scouts are aware that whatever does get built there is going to take some funds to for the upkeep he's talking about how to build it well no well that I'm talking I'm talking about um, community group driven projects let's leave this one out of it okay that just happens to be one that's on the plate those kind of projects which I think are wonderful and I think we need to encourage but given the way funding is given the way staff time is how do we f how do we fit those into a master plan so that w so that we're not into squeaky wheel mm -hmm. and not really taking care of community needs it's just something that's been troubling me I had to bring it up I know there's not a good solution and I apologize because it's but, late but it's but it's good to bring up that elephant too yeah, yeah. I, I've had the same concern and yeah it, it, to, me, to me it sounds like an uh, uh, it is a very ambitious project uh, and probably not all components can be done and, but the fact is nobody was doing anything with that park and that's true uh, I, I I believe that didn't, didn't the Girl Scouts come and talk to parks before they jumped into this correct not? there was a letter of support from uh, Scott Archer before initiating yeah. so the it, process it wasn't you know it it, it went through a process mm -hmm. so uh, not not a not a yeah. not a detailed one but it went through a process and the whole catalyst for the Girl Scouts doing that was when Merrill Hurst moved their preschool from Barclay School to um, Mount Pleasant and picked up their play equipment and took it with them because <laughs> that play equipment that was next to Barclay Park people thought was park equipment and small children played on it all the time and one day it was all gone because it never really was park equipment and that's was the catalyst for the Girl Scouts looking for someplace else for small children to go well I think I, 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 I think to answer your question from my perspective I keep listening to this proposal and I'm excited about the next one from somebody else but my priority list for prac has never changed it's Glen Oak number one it's Filbert run number two and anybody else that wants money has to get in line and if and if the, in this group or any other group comes to us my my point of view is that they have to be judged along the priority list equally and this group has never once asked for money from us yet and so we but haven't had to address that okay and, and that's how I'm just kind of we just keep going forward until that time comes and then you have to make the tough decision I agree with your statement that those are priorities for SDC used funds but if the capability comes in to bring other funds in for other projects in that, 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 in absolutely that, just and like uh, Kanema Park Kanema Children's Park that yeah. was one that kind of stepped off to the side because of alternative funding yeah and I agree and we need to encourage it and that's why I said that at the start of what yeah. I said yeah. we, we want to encourage it but I think 
it's it's still there. Yeah. there <laughs> there's still a struggle because no matter how um, uh, outside funded this is, whether it's the funding or the maintenance or whatever, when the next project comes along and it's not as well thought out and was well supported as this one, and all of a sudden, you know, it 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 turns into more of a burden on SDC or maintenance or whatever. I guess, and this kind of ties in with Bill or. or uh, with the idea of we need to talk about other sources mm -hmm. of funding, we do, and this kind of community support uh, program is could be huge, and I think we I think we need to encourage it, but I think we got to think about how we can make it all fit because it isn't going to happen in a vacuum. It's going to take staff time. It's going to take Jonathan Waverly and his staff, whatever. Um, I, and I'm not throwing water on this proposal. I love this <laughs> proposal. I think it's great. Let me get that back out there again. I and I think but we need to encourage more of it. But we need to talk about how it fits in, to the our, in our plan. in their master plan. Yeah, I mean, even if even if someone, let's say a benchmate or Phil Knight or someone like that, came in with a pile of money and said, "I love this. Let's do this project." Mm -hmm. Still, it does involve it will involve the city and mm -hmm. ongoing for sure. So you know, and and to date, it has involved some staff time, but very minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and we <laughs> continue to support them and their efforts and finding additional partners, um, knowing the very limited budget resources that we have for a project like that. When I was her age, I was throwing rocks at trees. I mean, you know, she, she was just going <laughs> presentations on it. It's great. Bill Daniels, what do you have to I'll share with us? I'll keep it short, but I wanted to encourage everybody to, to, to go walk down at Clackamas Park at the high flood level it is at cur currently. Um, I want you to look at that when we start talking about waterfront master planning and, and particularly that park will be the focus of that whole planning on our agenda standing agenda uh, and one of the major things that we'll have to be looking at is where we're going to have to put another boat ramp into the the river and if you take a look at the Willamette right now um, you'll understand that there's some problems with that as well and of course the Clackamas side is is difficult at best and we found that out but that's what I'd like to do is encourage you to pull over stop and take a walk uh, at least all the gates are locked right now it's up pretty high uh, and of course the camp host is ready to move out they've already gone up to, to the uh, um, skate park and they've been there for several maybe the better part of a week now um, week, so yeah. I, that's what i want to do just encourage you to take a look at that so when we're looking at master planning that's going to be something that we're going to want to when we're looking at a plan in front of us on paper how that's going to work and we're going to be talking about all the the uh, RV facilities that are there and what we need to do with that and and to see what's what in its current this 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 flood is is another example of what it can look like every several years now it seems like it's quite often that people who have come to this community a little later right. say that again what's that it's not a hundred years no no <laughs> so we need to think about that years. while we're <laughs> beginning our input for how to master plan for that park thank you Bill Blaine I'm not going to steal your thunder, but I, would, I did attend the Newell Creek uh, Canyon um, uh, update, and I was just encouraged that um, they want to collaborate with groups like Oregon City Trail Alliance and Parks Foundation and Northwest Trail Alliance and other groups, Lions, Rotary, whatever, you know, to help uh, maintain the trail. So I was encouraged by that. It'd be good to have community involvement. Um, just not necessarily related to parks although it, it could be but uh clackamas community college is starting a bike share program which is really cool and uh so we're glad to be a part of that um was uh, invited a couple weeks ago to the association of rail and transit advocates oregon washington idaho montana they met at the at the uh, union station uh, for their meeting and they asked for an update on the train station and um I was surprised by the amount of um, interest that um, uh, that raised among uh, train enthusiasts uh, and you know one of the things that I thought about uh, is that I'd like to find a way to use that to promote a lot of things but in particular our parks and trails so I don't you know we have a bulletin board down there but lots of people come by and look at that uh, bulletin board and i'm not sure some kind of display if we could think about that but uh some way of promoting our parks um, would be wonderful and get people out on the on the on the trails sorry about that speaking of trains 
Yeah. That's well timed. Yeah. Um, and that's that's all. I, I we are going to um, be having our grand opening on the fifteenth of April. So tax day. That'll help you remember. <laughs> which is actually Saturday. So I think tax day is like the 18th um, anyway. So, um, yeah. So. Okay. Um, so a couple things for me is um, today I attended the second meeting for the, um, the heritage group that is planning to be part of the Rose Festival. Um, so, again, please mark that Oregon City will be participating in the uh, Rose Parade in Portland oh, on June 3rd stop and it. Oregon City Heritage Days will be June 23rd and 24th where most of the museums here in town will be free on Saturday there will be um, a group giving tours in Pioneer Cemetery and um, so look for more information on that to come and not only Blaine and myself, but I know Lisa also came and Roger came Roger, yep. to the um, <laughs> to the metro meeting, um, the land use meeting held by Hillendale Neighborhood Association. Somebody else was there too. And Doug, were you, Doug yeah. yep, Doug was there too. See, there, was, <laughs> there were a lot of people. Oh, and Phil was there. I was there too. The fact Phil that was I there. Think we had a quorum. Uh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Uh -oh. um, yeah, probably, but um, we didn't make any decisions. But um, the, the major thing is, you know, they are moving ahead. Um, the big thing for, the, for our neighbors is there is not going to be um, a roadway lane between Otter Lane and Beaver Lane. There's not going to be a connection, but at the end of each of those two dead-end roads, they're planning on putting a hammerhead turnaround so that the garbage trucks and everybody else that comes down the street and needs to turn around doesn't have to try to maneuver um, into somebody's driveway to turn around um, and around all the parked cars that are already there in our neighborhood. So there will be what they call a hammerhead turnaround that will be big enough for a fire truck even to be able to to turn down there. So um, they don't have to beep, beep, beep back up all the way down our street. Um, the other thing that kind of was recommended right at the end, Metro has a policy of no dogs, no dogs on Metro property, except for one property that has some trails, paved trails, they allow dogs on leash. And Metro is going to be having a discussion about dogs in their park. And I understand we do not want dogs down in Newell Creek Canyon. We don't want dogs down there in the natural area disrupting the wildlife. But in that acreage that they bought to put in their entranceway, um, the neighbors already mow that and use that to walk their dogs. So one of the recommendations they had is for each of us to write to our metro councilor and say, hey, Carlotta, this is historically already been a dog walk and we'd really like to connect, be able to continue to walk our dogs just in this entrance portion, not down in Newell Creek Canyon. Um, so you encouraging be, Metro to are allow you asking dogs. Are for leashes on the, at that time or not? Is that what I'm wondering? Is that the? Well, yeah, it'd be nice to have leashes, but it, it depends. Right now it is the neighborhood dog park where we do walk our dogs sometimes on leash, but sometimes we take the ball. And the ball is a leash for our dog because <laughs> it's, it's what he does and brings it back. He's a retriever, what can I say? Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and yes, that they, they do plan on putting um, a porta potty, pretty much bathroom. Um, and it will not have um, wa be hooked up to water or sewer. Um, a chemical toilet a tanked system that they would have to extract regularly. Yeah. But that'll be closer over to behind the mini storage areas at the end of Warner Milne. <laughs> okay. So that's the plan from Metro at this time. Um, trying to think if there's 
anything else that anybody else has not yet mentioned about what's going on in, in our great city. Um, I know that the swim team at Oregon City High School um, got some awards this year. Some kids did really well. So they're part of, part of us, too, because they use our swimming pool. So thanks. Um, Can I say one thing? Uh, on Tuesday, the 28th, same day as the, so this is in the afternoon, or 1130 to 1, the Oregon City Business Alliance is doing a um, presentation on land use, kind of good, bad, and ugly, um, planning, policy, and so forth. So, And that's a luncheon, and you can sign up at the Oregon City Business Alliance website. Yes, um, uh, 1130 to 1 at the Abernathy Ballroom. The Abernathy Center? Abernathy Ballroom. Ballroom, yes. Ballroom, yes. Okay, the big one. Okay, um... Staff reports. I'll try to make this quick. A recreation report uh, you all should have received last Friday uh, through email. Um, park operations facility. Uh, we are uh, scheduled to present to the city commission at the work session on uh, April 11th. I unfortunately do not have more information to share as we're still awaiting some um, uh, further information from the architect for the project. Um, and then Oregon City Enhancement Day, I have some uh, postcards if you'd like to, to grab one. Uh, it will be coming up on uh, April 29th, 9 to 12 at Wesleyland Park. and includes a light lunch and a lot of community building. So I would highly recommend everyone in TV land uh, that may <laughs> still be watching, as well as uh, PRAC members and those in the audience uh, to please uh, join us at Wesleyland Park. Is that um, the one that normally was down at Clackamat Park? Uh, it is the Arbor Day, Earth Day yeah. combined. Right. Okay, um, yeah, that for many years. Yeah. I know Doug is It's still. underwater, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, even on April 29th, we would hope that would some hope. of the water has gone down. Um, and then one more note, uh, just for those that uh, may uh, be trying to get a hold of me over the next week, I will be uh, out of the office um, next week. So it's spring break. Um, it is spring break. I'll be uh, uh, on a, we'll see if I actually return. I have four kiddos and a car trip. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if I make it back or so not. So are you going to give us your private cell number so we can go? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only Doug. Um, and so if you need any assistance in the interim, uh, Denise Conrad is available and we'll be here all next week. Future agenda items. And we've already talked about a few. Uh, this, this, I would suggest this is a a future agenda we have soon. But we've got a lot of development uh, on more than one place. But off of Central Point Road, no park land identified. That development is going forward. Uh, there's still land that has to that can come in. Central and, Point Road. Yeah, yeah, the old Wheeler Farm, Christmas Farm. Being oh, developed. oh, okay. So that's at South End. No, Is that, that's that right? Central Point. Central uh, Point. It's a different road. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, it's a major. It's a major. Nothing neighborhood, though. You're right. <laughs> it's it's not the same neighborhood. That's in your neighborhood. <laughs> no, it's anyway, neighborhood. It's South End neighborhood. That's what I thought. No, it's the it's the Wesley Lynn. Uh, uh, as far as city neighborhood associations, it's South End. No, you've got a combined neighborhood association that's working there. It represents it. South End, Hazel Grove? Yeah. Yeah, Hazel Grove. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't what's the <laughs> So anyway, the point is we, we have to have develop some development policies that require the developers to set us, us, uh, aside land. I mean, uh, we're getting larger areas that just aren't getting parks. The old neighborhoods, they all have a lot of parks. A lot of them they don't need. There's a postage stamp parks. Mm -hmm. But the point is, some of these newer neighborhoods, they don't have any. And and, and that's where you got young people coming into. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So putting that one on the agenda, the new development on Central Point Road that looking to identify parkland. Is that? Well, yeah. Or 
We're, just keeping I it on our radar. Something I think has to come out of planning. That the developments that come in have to have set asides. I, I think uh, maybe Doug is referencing maybe uh, an acquisition strategy uh, when we have new development that's requested within the city uh, to have dedicated parklands. That's right. Yeah, so should maybe the agenda item be for us to discuss maybe forwarding or recommending that's onto the Planning Commission? Yes. How to do that? No, 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 we have no power. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it is. It, well, I know we don't yeah, have any power, but, but, but we, we can, can advise that. That's right. Recommend. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's what, it, yeah, exactly right. I do know that uh, when we identified Wesley Lynn Park, yep. and I wasn't on the tour, but we, as a, as a PRAC group, we took several different Saturdays at that time. Um, this FYI, it seemed to work really well to have the PRAC go out on a, a Pioneer Community Center bus or whatever, but as a group, and look at the possible selection sites that Doug's talking about in that general area that would probably be and prioritize, at least as our group would be concerned, what, what would be the most immediate that we'd want to try to preserve for a park. And that seemed to really work well uh, in identifying Wesley Lynn Park. We had about three three or four candidate parks or areas that we that we had. Sorry, I'm sorry, but that we had in mind. And, and if, as a group, we kind of, it was nice to go out. If we couldn't make it, we'd go out on our own to look up the addresses. But it was nice to have um, <clears throat> Jonathan drive around or whatever, but to get our group out there in, in that area you were talking about. Does the city have the ability, and I'm thinking on the Beaver Creek concept plan, that if a developer comes in and says, I'm going to build 50 acres, and they put out the plan, does is there a dedicated set-aside amount that they have to then, I, I even because there are yeah. parks in the plan, yeah. then how does that plan actually, when they go through the yeah. permitting process, is there a requirement? Yeah, I, I think there probably is okay. because it's a master plan okay. area. Uh, I think the way that it was used to be done, and in the areas that are already within the urban growth boundary, but that aren't part of a master plan, which is the case over here off of Central Point, the, the city would permit a greater density if the developer within set set aside land, and that was one mechanism that was used yeah, the in the past. But I just don't I don't see that happening now. Well, PUDs were, yeah. Is that what you're referring to, planned unit developments? Yeah. yeah, when, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and those have been removed from our yeah. ordinances. Yeah, definitely. and so, and so we've lost that capability. So, is next month going to be soon enough for this discussion? Well, I, I would say it didn't have. I think we've got so many things that are being piled on us, but I think it should be a discussion item that uh, uh, occurs that so we could make a rec recommendation I would say within maybe three or four or five months Bill um, some of us may be aware that um, the, the two uh, buildings up at Waterboard Park have been discovered as historic buildings from the Camp Adair World War II uh, site uh, if you've read any of the local and it's also been nominated for historic status those two buildings will probably either be used on site or, or moved to a different location so it will affect that park now that whole park that we're talking about is still the park that Public Works is still planning on moving into so uh, more than likely those buildings which were originally thought to be um, of no significance would have been taken down now there is a, a reason to and there are, um, it's got a historic nomination and I think it's going to be passed by the Historic Preservation League of Oregon uh, next month so it'll be on our plate about um, the fact that it affects a park um, whether it's in the status the legal status of that area is still to be determined but those buildings may or may not be moved to the part of that park that is considered that's not under debate or it may be, they may be moved to another location. But I think that's a month from now, and I think most of that will be determined by at that point. I'd like to see that on the agenda, if we can, uh, at least uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Camp Adair buildings, at least having a presentation of, of the historic nature of those buildings that may end up being put on other park property in our city. Yeah, and uh, I, I would have to... Um confirm with uh, with the city attorney to make sure because it is still pending litigation 
uh, before uh, discussing in a <coughs> more formalized context within this group. Okay, so we'll hold on to that and until the designation it either comes through and and um, okay. I, I will add again whether it's on the agenda or not. If you, uh, uh, Mr. Bus came last meeting and handed out. In fact, I'd like to get you handed out the master planning of 1952, and of course it, it included Waterboard Park as one of those parks. Yeah. And if you had a chance to read about that, even the, the buildings are mentioned in there, the cannery building, and, and so it might be a nice little bit of homework if we do get this on as an agenda item to, to review that. That's a really neat report. Yeah, I read it. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> and there is a section in there also that discusses the McLaughlin Plaza, mm -hmm. some street renaming even, I think, in that area. The gems in our library. Yeah. <laughs> At Carnegie Library. Just another reason to go to the library. <laughs> Located on McLaughlin Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, yeah, if, I, if I might, before I close that. You know, some of these things about signage and so forth, there's, a, there's tremendous historic history to, to these lands. And what ought to happen, signage just, you know, says what it is, is what it is. But actually to have a, a plaque or something that actually describes the history of that site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And the one with the children in this group that are still little kids that... I mean, that's important to me for them to learn what this is. And I, that's why it, it's so important to me to keep those names around because yep. I don't want them to lose that. Yeah. And by the way, that the play structure at the library on a sunny Sunday noontime when I happen to be going by, it is just so wonderful to see it filled with kids. I'm not too sure about the skateboarders out there, you know, um, but uh, <laughs> so. I don't think the so, library staff is either. <laughs> so I don't know what's being done to um, discourage them because there's a lot of really cool places those kids were using. Um, and that water fountain is, is pretty wonderful um, to learn a lot of new skateboard tricks. So I'm sure that's a discussion that is going to be continuing with the library too. Um, all right. So Phil, you've got all those things listed for future agenda items. I do. And may I, we may will I ask one other question before put it out. Yes. I'm sure. Um, have you already included for next month's discussion uh, budget discussions at that time, bringing it to Prague before the the proposals from your department? So we could be briefed on that before we went to, we've, if we do it to go to city budget. Is that something that would, is that something you've done in? in we received that copy right of last month. Yeah. Of well, what? the what we received last month was the um, the SDC budget, mm -hmm. and it was the um, revenue side of the SDC budget. So um, the um, proposed. Uh, budget for each of the um, each of the departments is not finalized yet uh, so the official copy the public copy that will go out is a draft uh, proposed version um, the city manager takes input from each of the departments and then um, puts together his uh, proposed budget that's presented at um, the budget committee meeting which includes the city commission and then additional members of the public um, it is not uh, an official document until um, they receive it. I mean, I, I can speak to some of the pieces. So if we would like to discuss at next month's meeting, I know that we kind of talked to some of the larger projects that were included. Um, I can tell you the budget direction that was given to each of the department heads was a 0% budget uh, from the last biennium to the, the next biennium. So we were asked to um, keep costs uh, at at zero percent, except for um, pieces that were already approved by city commission during the city commission goals retreat. Um, so, if you would like a more detailed discussion on the budget, we can probably have that discussion. But um, at next month's meeting, but I probably would be able to speak more to it uh, during the the May meeting. 
So our April 27th meeting, would be, it wouldn't be an official uh, report to the commission by April 27th? That wouldn't be the document you'd be... That, that's just the draft document that's going to be discussed mm -hmm. at the budget meeting, which is going to be May 1st. May 1st, correct. So is that something we could hear before? Uh, um, I can follow up and see what the, because, um, again, we would probably want to be consistent across all mm -hmm. um, all boards and commissions. But um, I, I can definitely speak to um, items that might be of interest to this group. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have a more... Um, thorough understanding of probably what would be moving forward uh, at the May meeting. But at the end of April, I probably could uh, speak to the um, proposed budget from the city manager. Uh, I don't know that I would have a copy that I could share with you um, as it typically is presented to uh, the, the budget committee in the first official presentation to uh, any of the public bodies. Okay. I was just thinking if we had additions or suggestions that you were asking for earlier on the budget, that might be helpful for us to understand more fully a, a suggestion we might have between then and the actual presentation to the budget committee. Yeah, and, and I can, um, maybe I'll work with the chair and vice chair to, to try to determine the best way to approach that, okay. given that Makes. input. Especially mm -hmm. have a list of, of the things that have been approved mm -hmm. for parks, and then, again, you know, the zero percent increase so yeah, it's just going to be um, just <laughs> <laughs> you know stay the course and hope the flood doesn't rise too high well, I'm, and i'm trying to think if there's a way to give some guidance on this the important things that i think we discussed in the last biennium at the end was related to the uh repair uh maintenance additional money that the city commission sent back to this department and maybe the top five or ten there it, you know that might be a place where we would want to give some guidance rather than looking at the whole budget i don't know if that would mm -hmm. address your need but kind of thinking along the line we've we've been there before yeah I don't know if that helps me stop staring at me <laughs> <laughs> all right and if any you know burning thing comes up be sure to just you know email phil and myself and uh, chris too as vice chair and say hey you know, if something crops up, let us know that we can possibly add to that agenda and move some things around. So, I'm going to make a request. We've had a lot of dates of things coming up mentioned at this uh, particular meeting. Is it a possibility to just set a brief email or have somebody in staff send a briefing? Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. yeah, I can definitely send an email out. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Then at 9:47, I. Close this meeting.